Good afternoon. Today is Monday, May 1st. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Griffin. Here. McCormick. Present. Vicious. Conwell. Here. Harrison. Casey. Present. Palencic. Santana. Spencer. Mr. Chairman, your report. All right. Thank you so much. And uh, this Committee of Finance, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion is called to order. First and foremost, we're going to have uh, ordinance number 188-2023 by Council Members McCormick, Griffin, and Hairston by departmental request, an emergency ordinance authorizing the Director of Economic Development to enter into a tax increment financing agreement with 1900 East 6th Street LLC or its designee to assist with the financing and fidelity hotel project to be located at 1900 East 6th Street to provide for payments to the Cleveland Metropolitan School District and to declare certain improvements to real property to be a public purpose. Um, Anybody from Economic Development here? Yes, Conrad. sir. What's your name again? My name is Conrad Metz. I'm with Economic Development. I'm representing the director today. Thank you so much. So if you could, could you please um, announce your guests? I know many of us know them, but. Yes, well, our guests today representing the project are Mr. Brandon Ames. He's the director of social impact investing at the developer, Nuovo Re, and also attorney Teresa Metcalf Beasley, attorney with McDonald Hopkins, who I suspect many people already know. Okay. All right. Okay. okay, so who's going to be presenting the project this afternoon? I can, I can give an overview, or do you want you guys want to? Do? Okay. Give and just before we start, I want to make sure one eighty-eight that we. Okay, well, go ahead. I think you'll go through it in the presentation. But if you guys can go ahead, please. Present. Right. Exactly. The uh, the Fidelity Hotel project was. Please talk into the microphone. The Fidelity, oh, I see the difference. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Fidelity Hotel project, is what we're calling it, is a project by 1900 East 6th Street LLC. The, um, the developer is requesting to support the renovation of the Fidelity Baker building. Uh, it's located at 1900 um, East 6th Street. And it's between Superior and Euclid, and then Short Vincent dead ends right at the building. Uh, the, uh, this is a century old building, and the lifestyle operator that, who will be managing the uh, hotel uh, is expressing this as tucked away smallness in the downtown of a big city. It's an independent boutique hotel. Uh, importantly, the, uh, the estimated TIF value is about 4.4 million, and the create, there will be a creation of approximately 105 full-time equivalent jobs at the site with a payroll of $1.9 million. And the total investment is, will be approximately $64.3 million. Okay. That's right. Please proceed. Good afternoon, uh, Chair and Committee. I'm going to run through a brief overview. Uh, the last time I was here, I didn't have a chance to uh, talk about the way that we approach our projects, uh, how we uh, take on impact hospitality, and so I wanted to give a, a simple overview and presentation. We are, as Nuovo, we're primarily focused on social impact at the center of everything that we do when we do a development project. We're focused predominantly on hospitality. Uh, today we have two projects that are complete, three projects in the pipeline, and one thing that's really important is that each one of our hotels we hire a director of impact. And that person is solely responsible for going out into the community, ensuring that we're hiring who we need to hire, finding a diverse set of vendors within the community. In each of our locations we have this person who's then reporting back to us and we're ensuring that each of our assets are being integrated within the community and we're taking on programming and events and all sorts of different things that prop up the community. Uh, our focus areas are around quality jobs, workforce turnover, neighborhood vitality, environmental leadership, local reinvestment, and impact education and influence. And uh, I'll expand on those a little bit further. 
the key objectives and goals with this project are to one, redevelop. This is an underutilized historic building that's been sitting vacant for quite a while. And so that's our number one priority is to take this and put it back within the market. So it's generating uh, you know, tax revenue, it's providing jobs, and it's an asset that's bringing value to the community. Uh, the second portion of this is community. We want to engage and support uh, organizations throughout the greater Cleveland area. Workforce development. Uh, part of how we drive social impact is taking care of what we have going on internally. We're hiring folks, we're making sure that we're collaborating with local programs and people who are you know, looking for employment. The additional piece of that is we're also looking for opportunities for those folks to upskill and progress within our hotel ecosystem. Local vendors is the next portion of what we focus on. We are very active. Uh, in sourcing local vendors, minority vendors, small businesses, and I'll talk about a few of the statistics from uh, one of our use cases of our uh, longest operating hotel to date. And then uh, we want to be great stewards of the community. We want to be reflective of the community. We have a unique approach to how we do each one of our developments. Impact experience, uh, our oldest hotel is Hotel Revival in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, it opened in 2018, and one of the key things that we did was retain the workforce during uh, the pandemic. And the reason that we did that is, one, we still wanted to provide employment opportunities, too. But the second portion of this is a lot of times people separate social impact from profitability. And interestingly enough, we came out ahead within the market because we retained this workforce. So when things started opening back up, we had the workforce available, people were trained, they understood what was going on. Uh, we have a number of community events that we hold annually. 50% of our spending at that hotel is local, with local vendors, minority vendors, woman-owned vendors. And it's very intentional on our part to do that. Uh, a third of those are, is fall in the supplier diversity category. And I want to uh, make sure that I emphasize here, I think a lot of people think about food and beverage and things like that. But at this particular hotel, there's a company called Laura Tush. And we invested our dollars with them by buying a year's worth of toilet paper. They're a sustainable toilet paper company. And interestingly enough, that happened, it was around February, March of 2020, and we were the only ones with toilet paper. And it, it's, it's just an interesting story that we found somebody local who could produce this for us. And we don't have to just do food and beverage. We look at the whole spectrum of how we're spending dollars locally. And those are the sorts of outcomes that you end up with. Um, we also started a small uh, pitch competition where we partnered with a few people locally and we brought on a vendor for a year contract and uh, provided that vendor $10,000. <clears> and also when we get engaged with the community, uh, we, we have a hospitality career academy is what we call it. And it's just creating a relationship with a local community college, university, someone of that sort where we have a pipeline, a workforce pipeline that we uh, can pull from when we uh, have vacant jobs and we need employment. The additional portion of that is then we have a relationship to give our current employees an opportunity to upskill and to increase their uh, educational and movement op opportunities. Um, at the bottom here you see Cleveland Impact Opportunity. This is the initial way that we're going to approach the similar sort of framework for Cleveland. Uh, it's it's not all inclusive. There's still a lot more work that we've been getting into and folks that we've been meeting with in organizations, but that's just a quick summary of uh, how we are applying the same exact framework to Cleveland. Thank you. All right. Anything to add, Ms. Beasley? Uh, since, to the chair, just since I met the team, they have been engaged in Cleveland and meeting with various people from downtown Cleveland Alliance, um, Destination Cleveland and other organizations to become more involved in the community, including our councilman and council president. Awesome. And I just want to commend you guys. I mean, you guys have been putting in, I think it was about probably 18 months ago when you first started planting the seeds on this and everything that you said that you were going to do is pretty much uh, panned out. So um, before I go into any line of questioning, um, I do want to make sure that, well, let me ask a couple of questions first just so that I can understand. Mr. Metz, um, this has been verified by an outside underwriter. So it's my understanding all of your projects are now starting to get verified by an outside underwriter? Yes, that is correct. Has that always been the case or is that just now I've happening? only been here less than a year, so I 
can okay. speak to that. Well, that's, uh, that's good. Um, the other thing that I want to make sure that I understand, the total investment of this project is $64.3 million. Yes. But the only thing that we're asking for is not any money into this, but pretty much the TIF will go into the project finance. That is right? correct. That's the only ask. Okay. And the total amount of that TIF for, four, 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 year to year is what? 4.4. 4. 4.4? 4. 4. 4. Yes, sir. So over the life of this uh, project, there will be about $4.4 4 million yes. dollars that won't go into the city, but it will go into the financing of this project. Yes, sir. Okay. One of the things that I'm starting to learn some tricks of the trade with developers is how do we make sure that uh, this wasn't something that um, we're financing and then in about another 10 or 15 years, they use that money to refinance their hotel. Are we looking for those kind of loopholes and making sure that we don't have any of that in there? We are, we are looking at those and we have not found any. Okay. All right. And then last but not least, I see that you have, um, and, and this is, you, you've just come in under the community benefits, but it looks like a lot of these you are already working with us on community benefits. Could you help us understand a little bit more about what community benefits and what monetary amount, I don't see it readily available, but what monetary amount out of this $64.3 million project, um, how are you going to make sure that there is um, a strong community benefit or MBFBE participation as well as professional services and jobs after the fact? Uh, Chair, so a number, we, we have a, we've started working on the community benefits agreement and it starts with education is a, one of the first places that we have. I'm trying to pull up uh, the draft that I have here to walk through some of this. Um, but I, I think. To the chair, if I may, oh. just also, okay. well, you can keep looking, okay. but. So, as you are aware, we are required to um, comply with Chapter 187, 188, and 189 and enter into a workforce development agreement, which actually we have already entered into the workforce development agreement. We will continue to work with ED and law on a community benefits agreement, and I know that's in the process of um, being changed a little bit through Council's actions but we will work with them directly. So there's not a dollar value that we've assessed to it right now, but we will have community benefits. Right. And Mr. Metz, I would really hope, because um, I know we've been working closely with Director Jackson, Yes. Um, but at some point in time, this is not just for you, but also for this body. Uh, one of the things that we really want to make sure um, is that we want to proactively understand community benefits agreements, because as you just stated, that's kind of the process that we're trying to change on council. Mm -hmm. uh, once we pass legislation, we don't know. And it's pretty much out there and up to the administration, which we trust you know, Director Jackson to come up with a strong community benefits agreement, but we'd like to know those things up front. So that'd be helpful, okay? All right. Uh, did you have anything else? You were looking up something, but you couldn't find it, so. That basically sums it up. Okay. Mr. Chair, thank you. Okay. This was heard in uh, DPS, which is chaired by Councilman Anthony Hairston, and uh, this is in Councilman Kerry McCormick's uh, area. Councilman Hairston. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. So, uh, yes, this was heard in DPS. Just as a reminder, uh, TIFs go through a two-part process, chain of title, and then we come back for the actual TIF uh, legislation. Uh, Mr. Mr. Um, give me your name again. Uh, Brendan Ames. Mr. Ames have been uh, before us uh, several times and presented his project along with uh, uh, Ms. Beasley. And uh, they, at our last meeting, they did share some additional, and I'd like for you just to dig into those a little bit, some additional ways that you support uh, the local community in terms of your uh, purchases and procurement uh, and um, uh, trainings and other things that you mentioned that will be a part of uh, what you all will be doing here at this project. And I believe you mentioned through the chair to Ms. Ames that that was done in other uh, uh, cities where you've done uh, similar developments. Uh, Mr. Chair, through you to the committee, uh, uh, what the councilman is referring to is one of the pieces that I talked about last time was sort of a direct translation of what the, basically a, low, a redistribution of 
these sort of city subsidies and that they're going to go to um, local vendors. And so the equivalent estimate, and I emphasize that this is an estimate because the project is not underway and we're not operational, but uh, essentially over a course of a few years, in, on a regular basis, we could be giving anywhere from, or spending rather, I should say, uh, 300 to $500,000 with local uh, vendors. And, you know, within a very small trade area from where the property is, uh, I apologize, I don't remember the exact number off the top of my head, but there are a couple thousand vendors. And this is how we start to sort through and figure out who we can utilize uh, to bring into our ecosystem. And these are dollars that are spent locally which also contributes to local jobs, helps support these local businesses. So although the, the, this is TIF and it appears as though there's a little bit of a loss, one of the things we'd like to emphasize is that we are spending these dollars locally, putting them right back into the community. So there's, that, there's still tax revenue coming uh, to the city. It just looks a little bit different, but we're doing it directly by supporting local businesses. Sure. Thank you. And uh, to the chair, uh, to Ms. Ames, I think that's important for people to hear uh, because that's one thing that, that really uh, piqued the interest of the committee members at that time is that you will be actually giving business to local individuals, not going out to your bulk uh, furniture supplier or whatever bulk supplier you have that is going to just fund all of your properties. But you're going to really dig deep into the individuals who are here locally who can uh, provide uh, some goods and services for this particular property that's located right here uh, within the city of Cleveland and the, the county of Cuyahoga. So I just wanted to make that point to the committee that uh, in addition to what has been shared with us between the chapters 187 through 189, because uh, I know the president did bring that up and thought that would be a good, um, a good piece. Uh, other than that, there was uh, no further uh, issues with this, with this uh, piece during committee and fully support. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman uh, Hairston. Um, and I'll just speak for myself too. I mean, this has been in front of us several times, but I'll fully support this project as the Ward 3 council person. have had extensive conversations with the development team. Um, as was noted, this is a vacant building. Um, so this TIF applies to added value. It does not impact any existing tax revenues at all. It applies to uh, added value, which then is um, uh, Ms. Beasley put back into the project. Is that correct? To the chair, that is correct. Thank you. So again, um, added value on the project um, uh, as well as, of course, increasing the property value. Um, uh, again, really exciting uh, project for this, this stretch for this building. Um, and I think it's actually, from the, a market perspective, will do well um, because of kind of the niche um, uh, perspective of it and really appreciate um, the developments team kind of, as Councilman Harrison noted, proactive engagement on local community involvement and in, in, uh, purchasing. Um, I've got Palencic and Conwell. Anyone else want to be on the list? Palencic. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman, my colleagues to the administration representative and to the developers that are here at the table, including Ms. Beasley. Um, the, four, the council president indicated 4.4 million is the um, a dollar amount associated with the TIF, correct? Yes. And yes, that's sir. over the 30 year period. Yes. Um, then in the, my question is to the administration, on your, um, Summary. Um, we never get that figure in a summary. Is there one or is there a reason why we never get the cost of the TIF? I do not want to keep harping this or repeating myself, making an excuse, but this is only my first TIF presentation. Okay. Well, I, I would hope you would take back when the, the presentations come in on the summary, we should know exactly what the TIF costs. Yes, sir. The, the, because the, the TIF is for property taxes, and that's the cost to um, over the 30-year period um, as it pertains to the new improvements, not the existing um, that is absolutely tax, correct. Rate, tax rate for the building. Yes, but, I, but I think that's important that that be in the summary so we can just get a better understanding as it pertains to what our financial commitment is, and then again, as Councilman McCormick indicated, we want to make sure that it's clear that uh, as it pertains to the existing taxes being paid, that there's no loss. Uh, Correct? 
correct. Right. It's a non-school TIF also. Right. And please talk into your mic. I'm sorry. Hear you. Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. That's correct. Okay. So I, I would re request that, respectfully request that through the chair to the administration, that in each uh, new TIF coming to the table, we need to know what that dollar amount and is for what period of time. That's yes, I will share that helpful. with the director. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Calsman, great point, too. And I think another important nuance here, too, this in, through, or to um, Mr. I'm sorry. Metz. Metz. Um, this is a 40% TIF. Is that correct? I'm sorry, a what? A non-school TIF yes, is 40% is. of the added value because the 60% still goes to the school district. Is that correct? That is correct. Thank you. Um, Council President, we've got Councilman Conwell and then KZ. All right, Councilman Conwell. Very, very fun. Turn this microphone on. With uh, through the chair to um, this young man. What's your name? Uh, Brendan Ames. Yeah, I like what you said about the dollars. You mentioned tax dollars also. Don't forget the payroll dollars that were going to the city of Cleveland. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the businesses, but we also will get um, a 2.5 percent payroll dollars so we can pay for the uh, um, quality of life issues, police officers, building the housing, your salary, all of that. It will bring dollars for us, which is very, very good. I like your purchasing and procurement. Where, when you mentioned the um, toilet paper, are you uh, looking at purchasing and procurement that's ongoing through the chair? So you're looking to uh, purchase from um, other minority vendors? The toilet paper is good, but what about other things? Uh, Mr. Chair, through you, uh, we look at the whole spectrum. So it, it starts with, obviously, construction and procurement and what we're doing across that. Uh, spectrum, but then once we move into operations, we look at our FF and E, our OS and E, so all of the products back of house. You know, when it comes to something like elevators, it, we're very limited in that capacity, and so we try to there. we try to overcome wherever we can in every aspect of the hotel. So if we're, let's look at curtains, let's look at pillows, let's look at mattresses, and we try to make sure that a lot of the vendors that we're working with have some sort of impact initiative, or they're minority owned, or they're focused on employing folks with disabilities, and so we look at the whole spectrum of all of our purchasing. And granted, we're just getting started. And I, you'd be hard pressed to find another hospitality company who will sit in front of you and talk about these things. And we're not fully there. It's going to take a lot of work. But you know, I'm pulling lists on a regular basis. I'm looking at folks locally, regionally, within the state, mm -hmm. um, you know, on either coast. And depending on, you know, th there is a pricing aspect to this. But we're trying to work out as much as we can to cover everything that we can ac across the spectrum, down to even, you know, maybe a mechanical person who's local to service our HVAC. So we're thinking about who we're spending our dollars with across every facet of what we're doing. Yeah, because, you know, you mentioned construction, and I see it in here, and I wish we had, and maybe I have to write some legislation on it. When you, you know, when you complete, when you close a project out to the chair, you also have preventive maintenance. It's ongoing. We mm -hmm. have to do the maintenance on... Um, any widgets that you have. And it would be great to have a list there. You hired quite a bit of African Americans or females or, and or on this list, but you keep that list and you continue to keep hiring in there because you can close a project out, but it's always preventive maintenance is ongoing to the chair. Uh, Mr. Chair, through you, I, I'd be happy in the future. I, I collect these reports on a monthly basis on all of our spending and the vendors that we're working with, and I, I end up with quarterly reports and then annual reports. And so as we get moving through this, I know we have some requirements through the OEO and the Workforce Development Agreement. For five years, there's supposed to be some tracking along with this project. But beyond that, uh, I'm happy to you know, continue the conversation and provide updates as necessary uh, around the progress that we're making across all of our vendors, who we're hiring, and what's going on across the whole hotel. Yeah, I'm going to come over there. Do, do the chair to Meadow. We have OEO. They'll do that with um, former council member Zach Reed. Or, um, you know, he always come in and monitor and control. They say he's pretty good. Um, so, you know, I'll just look at the list and see what he... He'll provide us an update. He'll give us a progress report, city council. So, you know, I'll, I'll look at that. Um, switch, moving forward, you mentioned the amenities such as a club room and a sports bar. Um, you know what I'm pushing for? 
and I'm just mentioning it to you through the chair of the arts. If you had a band in there, something like that, the arts, when you come to Cleveland, I mean, we're the rock and roll capital of the world. And I'm going to talk with restaurants and hotels this summer to include the arts in there as well. Hire some band members, hire musicians. And so when people come, when you visit Nashville, when you visit Austin, Texas, when you visit uh, New Orleans, you go there really because of the arts and because of the music. So we have to start pushing um, the arts in the, um, in the hotels. And, and that's, that's important. Uh, Mr. Chair, through you, uh, I'm really happy that you mentioned that because our operator, New Waterloo, is based out of Austin, Texas, and yeah, they do uh, it. they're known as being very friendly in terms of the artists and the artist community. In fact, I was able to meet uh, Greg, the CEO of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, who already knew of New Waterloo through okay, cool. their local music connections. And so uh, that, that's just one of the many reasons that they're our chosen operator is that they're focused on those types of things and so uh, I expect we will have no issues ensuring that we're uh, friendly to the arts and culture yeah. community. Entertainment, arts and culture to the artist and that's important uh, for me. That's it right there. Thank you very much. Thank you Councilman and Councilman Brian Casey. Thank you Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman to uh, Mr. Ames, right? Yes. All right. Okay, I remember. Uh, the last time we were here, I asked you about the energy provider for the building. Can you speak on that, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Ames? Uh, chair, through you, uh, we're going to be using uh, First Energy. First Energy is already servicing the building. And uh, from what I understand from our uh, key development person in our organization is that we would have to get a, uh, a new transformer. There were some lead times associated with switching over that energy provider. And so at this time, we haven't chosen to make the switch just because uh, pricing and costs related with this development and this project um, it, it's been increasing exponentially every, I would say, six to 12 months uh, that we wait for this project. And so uh, it would certainly affect our budget to start to move in that direction. All right, and Mr. Chairman and Mr. Ames, um, is the county putting in any help for this? I see in your <clears throat> proposed city assess assistance, it says here um, the county's providing district payments, or is that, is that a mis- that, doesn't sound, that does not sound familiar to me by the county uh, would have, it says, in the amount the district would have otherwise received but for the TIF by the county, and then in district payments. It's in your, it's in your. your the legislative summary. To the yeah, chair. The second. To the chair, oh, no. to the councilman, we are not getting any county assistance on this project. So that would be incorrect if it's in the summary. Okay, so the but for appears to be boilerplate. Sorry, I'll, I will address this with the director. And so, get Mr. Back to Chairman, you. to our presenters, this is just this is a typo. To the chair, through the chair, to the councilman, that would be correct. And, Mr. Chairman, then I know we ran into this um, issue last week with typos coming over in legislation. And Which I don't know if this is just, I don't know if this is just, I don't have the, the, I'm just going off of what we were given today. The, and the legislative, the De Department of Economic Development summary for legislative file, this page So that's here. the summary, but not the legislative. Right, I, I don't have a copy of the, the legislation in front of me. I'm just. Okay. And I want me to read all this in 10 seconds, <laughs> not yet. It, it doesn't state anywhere in the legislation, then, does it, about the county? No. The only thing that it has in here is about the county fiscal officer or treasurer. Other than that, no. It's, uh, no, it, it does. In the legislation, mm -hmm. under project summary description, if you look at the page, it's page one, two, three, page four. Under proposed city city assistance, boilerplate two, it mentions TIF by the county, and then in parentheses, it, it quotes district payments. But 
uh, Mr. Metz, could you explain that? Because I, I, I think I understand it, but you're the economic development expert on this? I am a professional, not an expert. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, you got any thoughts on this, if you could? Did you, do you have that in section number uh, under proposed city center, developer agrees to make certain improvements to the parcel and make payments in lieu of taxes equal to the taxes that would have been paid for the parcel but for the TIF. A portion of the pilots will be paid to the Cleveland Metropolitan School District in the amount the district would have otherwise received for the TIF by the county district of payments. That's just uh, it's the who we pay it to. Yeah, it's the, the mechanics. mechanics of, it's so the, the county doesn't how get the TIF. TIF. Yeah. How the TIF works because, sorry. To no, go ahead. That's good. The county collects the TIF payments. Right. Um, just like they collect taxes, the real estate taxes, and then they give the TIF back to the, the TIF to the city, and then, or to the escrow agent. Good afternoon. Correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Chair. I've just never seen. I've never seen this in. Did you in see one the language? Did we have the chief financial officer at the we, table? We, we, we got the expert here. <laughs> so go ahead, uh, Chief Abunama. It, uh, that's what I thought. It was more mechanics than anything. Um, not that the county's offering the TIF, that, but it's basically right. the department that processes the TIF to get it back to the city, right. is right. what I'm understanding. Right. Correct. Sorry. Mr. President. Mr. President. The and because they will pay the school district their portion, um, right. and then we get our portion from that. Right. So they handle all the payments. And that's pretty customary for mostly everything that we do yes. because we don't handle the tax collections for a lot of those properties on those. So the right. county always handles it. And it's it. payments in lieu of taxes. Yeah. So it goes through the same process. So, Chief, did you have any comments? I know we're given our amateur interpretation. I am, at least. Miss. Uh, Ms. Beasley is, is, is on point as always, but if you could. I'll give you a <laughs> yeah. uh, to, the, to the chair of the council, I, just look, looking at the language, I would want to confirm uh, with the team, you know, maybe after the, the committee meeting, uh, this suggests to me that it, this could have come from the language for a TIF that actually included some of the school portion that would go back to the schools, but we can we can work that out and so make sure. So we need to clarify this language before we move back because we have our guests that flew in from out of town to be here and we're trying to, you know, we've held this for the last three weeks. Um, how long will it take for us to get this cleared up? Uh, through the chair, we could have it cleared up this afternoon. Uh, let's do this then. If you can get an answer to clarify that language, if you could. And then we'll bring you guys right back up after we hear these pieces so that we can try to make sure that we have a clean um, interpretation of that, okay? Yep. All right. So we'll hold it until they come back uh, with a presentation, and then we'll follow up at the end, okay? okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I'm going to move to the next piece. That one will be held until we get clarification, hopefully in the next hour or so. Uh, and hopefully we can make sure that we had that language uh, right. The next one is ordinance number 406-2023 by council members Bishop and Griffin by departmental request and emergency ordinance authorizing the director of public works to enter into one or more contracts with Case West Reserve University to provide a youth summer sports, nutrition, health, and life skills development program for 2023 under the National Youth Sports Program sponsored by Case Western Reserve University. University. And we have the coach with us today. This is for a sum of $150,000. We have uh, Commissioner Gisson Tanner. Uh, this is 406 2023. And uh, we have Commissioner Gisson Tanner, uh, Assistant Director Laird, as well as uh, Coach uh, Dennis Harris. Mr. Laird, I believe you are the senior member as of right now, and then uh, if you want to kick it over to Commissioner sure. Gisson Tanner, Mr. Uh, Harris. All right, good afternoon, uh, Chair, and to the uh, Council. Uh, this uh, legislative purpose of the legislation is the for instructional programming that uses sports participation and comp competition as a vehicle to promote active, healthy lifestyles, enhance self-esteem, promote respect for oneself and others, and reinforce the importance of education to one's future. And that, that, with this, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Commissioner Gisson Tanner. Uh, good, ma'am. Good, uh, I'm sorry. Good afternoon, Chairman and uh, Council. Um, I have with me Mr. Dennis Harris. He is the director of NYSP. 
NYSP program has been supported by the Department of Public Works Recreation since I've been in the chair, and that's been over 10 years. Excellent program. Um, Mr. Harris will answer any questions that you may have. Mr. Harris. First of all, it's an honor to be here to see such great people. I spoke earlier, I said this is one of the best city councils in the country because once again, there's over 220 universities and college had this program. Everybody went away, Cleveland stepped up. That's so important. So I just want to say thank you, thank you, and thank you. All right, well, this is one of the better programs in the city of Cleveland. Um, I know this was heard in uh, director, uh, I mean, in uh, gave, him a, gave him a promotion. Council um, and Bishop's uh, committee. But um, I do want to say full disclosure, um, even though my children are grown, my children went through this program as well as many other children in this city. And uh, this has been something that has been um, a very phenomenal program that we have done uh, a significant amount of support for throughout the year. So just want to give everybody that heads up. Uh, gives all these young people a great experience and exposure to a university setting uh, where they actually have an opportunity to say, hey, I could actually be at Case Western Reserve one day. Uh, so, Councilman Bishop, this was heard at DPS. Do you have any uh, comments? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. We, uh, we heard this in DPS, I mean, uh, MSP, and we fully support this piece of legislation. We are grateful that this program exists and to provide uh, guidance for our young folks doing the during the summer months, when uh, when they can be uh, they can be tend to be idle, so we we fully support this piece of legislation. Awesome. Okay. Uh, any other comments regarding this, Councilman uh, Councilman Kerry McCormick? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, fully support this legislation. I'm just curious um, to the Assistant Director to Coach is Are there beyond this legislation? Are there way that council members can support this program through? I don't know if you guys do community tours or things like that. I just had a big group yes. from uh, one of my schools do a whole tour of City Hall. We came in and busted in on Councilman Palencic's committee. And I mean, so I'm just, are there other ways beyond this that we can That's, support this? That is great what you just said, because I'm looking at Councilman Palencic. Yes, I brought a group to him. He stopped and talked. I don't know if you remember several years ago. They were so curious about city council. I was talking to my beautiful assistant director about, I want to bring our students down to city hall so they can learn government. We work year round. This is just a summer program, but you know the funding that you guys give me allow me to work year round. I'm in every school from, from Cleveland School Yards to West Side School, so I work year round. No, the funding you guys give us is really, really great, you know, and we take it to another level. Um, that's what this does. You know, your ward, the downtown ward, you know, those schools, you, you name it, that's where we've been. I've been on Wonderful. East Side School, West Side School. I've been at Case 40 years. I'm a former teacher, so I get it. I live in Cleveland. Yeah. You know, so I get it, and I love to come back maybe next year and present some another whole proposal of what we do because we kind of shortchange all what we do. You know, meeting you. I never forget when they came back that they met you, the people said, I want to be like you. They want to be like you because you talk, you kept it real about government. And that's what we have to do. You know, who's the next lead? Who's the next Mike? Who's the next Blaine? Who's the next Kevin? That's what this is about. Thank you. And Chair to Mr. Harris, just consider that I'll speak for myself and open invite. Um, be happy to host groups here, oh. show them City Hall. I'm sure my Thank colleagues you. would be interested as well. But just as a keep it on your radar. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, any other questions regarding ordinance number 406-2023? If not, uh, oh, go ahead. And my daughter went through his program and his witness. And she's a great teacher. <laughs> awesome. All right. Any other questions regarding ordinance number 406-2023? Uh, seeing none, it stands approved. Please sign on. Thank you all so Thank much. You. Appreciate you, Coach. Keep up the good work. We have to. 40 more years. Keep up the good work, Coach. You're doing a great job. 40 more years. And I believe he's a good resident award, too, as well, right? Yeah, I got my grades. Okay, got you. All right, next up is ordinance number 407-2023 by council members Bishop and Griffin by departmental request, an emergency ordinance authorizing the director of public works to enter into with the Northeast Ohio Muni Football League, AKA Cleveland Municipal Football Association, DBA, Cleveland Muni Football League to conduct a citywide youth football program. Uh, Mr. Laird and Mr. Commissioner Gibson Tanner, who do you have with us today? Uh, thank you. Uh, um, Chair, we, we have with us today Mr. Joe Record uh, from the uh, Mini Football League. I'm going to let uh, Commissioner Gibson Tanner 
Take it from here. Uh, chairman and, and this body, uh, Muni football has, has been around for 90 plus years. I participated in Muni football in 1980. Don't want to give you my age, but uh, yeah, East End Cowboys, <laughs> right, 1980. So uh, yes, great program, great program. I know you're looking and saying, East End Cowboys who? <laughs> Great program, been supported by the city of Cleveland for all of those years. Um, at, at this time, I'm going to let these guys, uh, Joe Record and Jason Dunn, who is the director of Uni Football, answer any questions that council may have. All right, Chair of Council. Uh, first off, it's, it's, a, it's an honor to be here in front of you guys uh, today. Uh, you know, I didn't participate in the earlier session. Uh, but I did watch it on television. You know, I was just just got back in a few hours ago. You know, on a trip with my, with my daughters. Um, you know, it was, it was a great thing. I definitely appreciate that. Um, you know, so council, council did hear. You know, some of our needs. Some you know some of the things that we have going on. And you know, just as we were at the table last year, Muni football grew. You know, substantially last year, and we are continuing to grow. You know, right now we're dealing with 98 flag football teams. Um, you know, one of the pieces that was missing and was mentioned was cheerleading. We do have cheerleaders out there right now following behind the flag football teams. As well, if we're, we're doubling these numbers on football, there's a big need for us to take care of our babies. And, and those, those are these young ladies. We don't want to get that mixed, missed in this piece that we're doing with football. You know, Muni football is, is a lot bigger than just the sport of football. You know, I heard, I heard everybody from council this morning, you know, telling their stories. Talking about, you know, their time spent in Muni football, and it is so important to the city of Cleveland, and as we grow this league, the need for more funding grows. All right. And Joe, then, Joe, Joe already made a statement, didn't he? Joe, how long has Joe been doing this, just by curiosity? This is my uh, 29th year. I turned it over to uh, uh, a younger Joe. Jason's doing a great job with us. Uh, the league has been around 104 years, okay, 104 years. Uh, this, uh, this is our 104th year, yeah. Uh, in 2020, we didn't play football, so when we came back in 21, we came back with 86 teams. And uh, Jason said, Joe, this year, 2022, we had 140 teams. And for 23, it should be somewhere between 140 and 160 teams. So parents are getting their kids more involved in sports. They want to get them out the house and get them active into activities. And uh, so far, uh, Jason's, Jason's been doing a great job getting the kids out. And we have over 500 volunteers in the community working. They're talking to parents and kids. So our, these are our coaches. So they are out there as community activists. And uh, they're really getting involved. So uh, this is all I have to say, uh, Chairman. That's great. That's great. Chairman, if I could just Commission. add, though, um, also what these gentlemen failed to mention is that they also participate in the flag football program. So for those parents that do not want their kids to play tackle football, this money also supports the flag football program by Muni Football as well. Okay. All right. So, just a couple of questions before I turn it over to uh, Councilman Bishop, and then I think I have Harrison. I mean, no, I think I have uh, McCormick and also uh, Polinsic and Casey Conwell. Uh, just just a couple of things that I want to say. Uh, one is. Are there areas that we may have have gaps in the city of Cleveland? Because I hear that sometimes that there are some kids that are trying to play, and I'll use, for example, gunning. Gunning is an area that has a large group of kids and folks that live in that area, but I'm not sure. It used to be the gunning gators, but I don't know if they're still there. But how do we make sure that it's equitable how we're serving all of these kids across the neighborhoods? I can, I can answer that. Chair to the council. Uh, right now we have a program that's over at, at Gun and Recreation Center. Uh, that program is called West United slash Gun and Gators. Um, so that, that is uh, uh, Daniel Stevens, a community member. He's from that area. Uh, they've been actively doing basketball out of there. Uh, they actually did some flag football this past weekend up there at Gun and Rec. 
So we, we have an, uh, a program up there right now that's servicing kids in the gunning area. All right, it'd be good to know how all of those are supported because, you know, I go to, I'm, I'm just a fan of Muni football, so mm -hmm. I go sometimes just to watch. And um, the good news that I have seen is that you've attracted teams from other cities now. So you got teams coming from Canton and Youngstown and other, uh, you know, adjacent areas, which I found great because that's, you know, I think we should be having these young people playing like that. But I just want to make sure that we don't have gaps in the city um, and how we are making sure that we cover most right. of the city. Right. And if we're looking at that, how do we make yeah. sure we do that? Community? Chairman, if there's uh, any uh, requests throughout the city uh, community where kids want to play, if that comes into the recreation office, I have a conversation with Jason and Joe, and they would develop a team in that community. Okay. So just as the Gunning Gators um, stepped away for a couple of years, we found that there was more kids that wanted to participate. I gave these gentlemen a call, and that's how they developed that team again. All right. And then you guys need to do a fairness cap or a, a, a cap because some teams have sponsors that have them decked out in the newest uniforms, the newest shoes, the newest sponsors. And let me say this, it's good mm -hmm. because they're doing it, but then other teams don't get that same support. So even though I don't want to take away from anybody that wants right. to make their neighborhood team look great, um, I never forget being a young kid growing up in the neighborhood I grew up in, and we had on just the latest pair of Dr. J's and going playing against teams that had brand new leather shoes on. Um, it does something. Yeah. So just want to keep in mind about parity and making sure that we look at those things and that we have a good process so that we don't have one group of kids feeling like they're um, not as valuable or worth the investment as others. Absolutely. Even though I know Absolutely. that sometimes individual uh, contributors make that happen and mm -hmm. some businesses are bigger than others, I just want to make sure that we have some kind of equity model across the city if we do Understood. that. Okay? Noted. All right. Um, I have uh, Councilman McCormick. Valencic, Casey, Conwell. Uh, but before I go to anybody, Councilman Bishop, this is already in your committee. Okay. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Yeah. Chairman. Oh, oh, Bishop. Who do you Bishop. want? Bishop. 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 Okay. okay, yes, Mr. Chairman, I'll be brief. We heard this in uh, uh, municipal services this morning. We fully support this piece of legislation. And what a great organization to support. Okay. All right. Uh, Councilman Kerry McCormick, Councilman Mike Palencic, and then Councilman Brian Casey. Thank you, Chair. I'll be brief as well. Um, really outstanding program. So thank you, gentlemen, for your continued good work here. Um, a quick question to the Chair, to the dire Assistant Director. I'm sorry, Assistant Director? Is that your title, sir? All right. Um, the 160, that reflects the increase that Council pushed last year. Is that correct? That's correct. That is okay. Correct. So that, and, and I want to give a shout out to Councilman Starr um, for really championing that last year. So, um, okay, and then um, same question I asked, as I asked the last group again, really excited about this. I'm happy the funding levels have increased. This is exactly the type of program when we think about proactive investments the city needs to be making, that we need to be making. So I'm really happy that we've increased the funding here. What other ways outside of this can council members support the league? You know, other ways council can be involved uh, oh, chair to the council, I'm sorry. Um, so a, a lot of our programs right now, you know, e even during these times, they're out on the corners. You know, they're out there with, with, with helmets. Uh, they're, they're trying to solicit funding. And, you know, the, the biggest need for our programs is funding. We're going through a year right now where we're doing helmet reconditioning. Uh, we're one of the few leagues uh, around the country, you know, that makes it mandatory that our helmets go in biannually to make sure that we're properly taking care of these kids and these kids are safe while playing the sport of football. Uh, we all know the game is under attack. Uh, you know, and then we're looking at $35 per helmet. Uh, right now, uh, we estimate we have about 1,200 helmets sitting down at Rydell uh, that's going to have to be taken care of. You know, uh, while we're doing our best to, to, you know, to raise funds uh, for this, you know, uh, every other year, the programs are also doing the same by standing on the corner, uh, selling popcorn, doing whatever they can during these tough times to raise funding. Thank you. And Chair, uh, to Coach, do the Cleveland Browns, do you have a relationship with the Cleveland Browns? I'm sorry, I missed you, I'm sorry, do you have a relationship with the Cleveland Browns? Uh, we they, do have a relationship with the Cleveland Do they support Browns. the league? Yes. Financially? Financially in, in, in a sum of $20,000. That's it? Yes. Okay. So that's, For the last 20 years, yeah. What's that? For the, yeah. For the last 20 years. 
Okay. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to I'm happy to hear that they're at the table, but it seems like that might be a way that we can help. Is this is a great city of Cleveland Muni League, and maybe you know expanding their partnership is the right thing to do. Right. Just me. Yeah. It's just me. Yeah. But yeah. Council, right. go ahead. I'm sorry. You know, Councilman uh, Conwell would like to have a point of view on that. Yes. Mm -hmm. On that point, Councilman. Yeah. Point. I reached out to the uh, Browns this morning. I reached out to Jenner. So that me and Council Member um, Starr, as well as Council Member Joe Jones, we have a conversation with them um, through the chair, uh, Council Member, would you like to be in, in that meeting also to as, actually get more dollars? As the member that represents the Cleveland Browns, absolutely. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. All right, thank you. Please proceed. Anything else, Councilman? All right, Councilman Mike Palinsic and then Councilman Brian Casey. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman, a lot of colleagues and to the folks in the administration, commissioner folks that are here at the table. I wholeheartedly support the uh, Muni football program. Um, football gave me an opportunity as a young man, um, uh, gave me really uh, hope and uh, taught me uh, the whole issue of teamwork and, and, and being a part of a team at Collinwood High School. Um, so I support it. My only concern is this, and I want to ex express this to the city and to the folks. Um, right now, Muni teams are playing at Humphreys, practicing at Humphreys, at Neff, and at Mandalay. And, um, and I'm concerned about the amount of litter that's being left after the practices, because then that falls on our folks to clean up the field. So I would hope that the it would be stressed to the coaches and the participants that um, that a part of teamwork and a part of community is not leaving where you're practicing a mess when you're through. So I want I want you to you guys to drive that home to the teams and the coaches because um, I get those calls. I get the calls from the surrounding neighborhood about the litter and the conditions after the teams leave. So I'm 100% in support. I think it's important. I'm glad to see the flag aspect because again there are a lot of parents today who want their kids to play contact football even though they love football but they don't want to play in the contact aspect and um, the cheerleaders I think are a very important component of this as well for young ladies to be involved in the community if there's ever a time in this city's history that we need to support youth related recreational programs it's today for what we see in the streets. It's, it's, it's a no-brainer, we gotta support that. And I gotta tell you, Mr. Chairman, and, I've, and the commissioner knows I've raised this in the past with then Director Cox, you know, for the Browns to only co commit $20,000 a year toward the Muni football program, my grandmother had a great term. She would refer to people like that as skin flints. Now, I don't know where that word came from, I don't know if it's from the South or from Europe or whatever, but the Browns got to quit being skin flints and they got to step up to the plate. And, and $20,000 is an embarrassment. It's an embarrassment. You know, it, you know really, you know, I, it, it, when I, 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 I cause I can, I got to tell you around the table here, I can remember a time when they wouldn't commit anything toward Muni football. And then we, we raised the issue at the table in the past, and then they wound up with, with a whooping 20 grand. But, you know, but they're, they're, they're not going to pay us any more rent at the stadium. They're not going to, they're going to not, going to not require us to make improvements at the stadium. We, they have got such a free ride in this city. And again, t for only $20,000 to support football for youth in this city. They ought to be embarrassed. They ought to be totally embarrassed about that figure. And we ought to embarrass them all. I can't wait for them to come to this table. Next time they've got their hand out, okay? 20 grand for Muni football, and you need equipment, and you need this, you need that. Unacceptable. So you don't want me in no meeting with them, okay? So I'll, you can keep me out of the meeting, because it ain't going to be a pleasant meeting if I get in a meeting with them, okay? So at the end of the day, they should be embarrassed, and I hope they learn about today's meeting. You know, they should at least, they should contribute the same amount of money that the city contributes toward the program. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And um, just on that note, I have a very um, 
interesting uh, request. Uh, benefactor said, how much money would you guys need if you guys were to look at raising some more money? Have you guys looked at any of those uh, costs? And Total if we have other people, as all my colleagues have said, that can try to help raise a few more dollars. Sure, yeah, yeah, uh, Chair of the Council, that, that total operating budget would be about 267000 And that's what you that's what your operating budget is now, right? Yes. So, so another 100000 At some point in time, Commission, if there's some hard ask, um, you know, and some hard things that we need to do, it would be good for you to arm us with that. Understood. So as we go and have discussions, like Councilman Pulisic and McCormick are saying, that we can give hard numbers of what is actually needed. Understood. Or how people can actually contribute. Because one thing about these kind of things is that people actually do see them and say, hey, I'll be willing to contribute something. Um, so just keep that in mind. You know, Chair to the Council. Oh, sure. I think Mr. Record. Uh, Chair, our insurance this last year was 38000 This year, it's over $58,000. We bought in security, three-arm security uh, staff at our fields. We used seven fields on, sat on Saturday and five on Sunday. And we staff in three security guys at eight hours per person at $35 an hour. Plus, at all our fields, uh, we have at the gate, we're checking all bags and wanding people coming in just to keep everyone safe. And we had to bring on additional staff because we have between 2,000 to 4,000 people at each location just coming in to watch games and we're not talking about the parents that drop their kids off just to watch games. I was one of those. I used to go over to Thomas Edison and watch games with my two older brothers as a, as a kid. And we would just be there all day long watching games. So we still have that going on. So we have to make sure that everyone in that stadium is safe. That's Got it. Okay. Um, I think that uh, covers the question that uh, the councilman had. Um, I, Councilman Pulisic, you're done, right? I'm done. Okay. All right. I got uh, Councilman Casey, then Councilman Harrison. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, just to piggyback off of Councilman Pulisic, um, I'm not even going to comment because it's absolutely laughable. And the Cleveland Browns organization and the Haslam should be ashamed of themselves for only contributing 20000 for for this league. Um, Mr. Chairman, to uh, Commissioner, do we know where the 160000 is coming from? Is this general fund dollars through the chairman to the councilman yes it is all right and then mr chairman maybe i know i know councilman Starr last year um advocated to increase it maybe we could in, you know maybe we could look at increasing it by another 40 or something like that just to to try to get these guys over the hump um considering how much they act they they do for our youth of the city because the one thing that i wanted to to touch on mr chairman to the to the to Mr. Dunn, and I coach, um, is one of the issues we have on 130th is kids from Uni League standing at 130th and 71 um, trying to solicit funds for their teams. And I don't want to see any kid out there in that kind of dangerous situation where they're soliciting money from passing cars standing on the corner of a highway in a major street um, just to try to get some uniforms or just to try to get extra cleats. So I would encourage you to reach out to all of us individually as well because there's no way that, that we should be allowing our, our kids uh, and putting them in the situation where they feel, whether they have to or not, but obviously they feel that they need to get out there to try to raise funds for themselves. And looking at your thing here, you're talking... Um, you know, six to seven year olds, all the, you know, from six to 14. And that's just inexcusable, not only for, for us, but for, for anybody who's going to allow that, especially when your operating cost is really compared to our city budget, only 267,000, which is, you know, such a small amount of money compared to, you know, things we sit here, um, you know, and pass on a daily basis. So, you know, if we could, if we could do something, you know, to help you guys out to get you that extra hundred thousand or whatever it is, 
I don't think there's a member on this side of the table or in the administration that wouldn't that wouldn't try to help out more, let alone the guys across the street from us. Um, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Dunn, I don't know if you were here there, but a couple of years ago we had a, a lengthy conversation on weight and bigger kids in the city. You remember that, yeah. right? And bigger kids in the city of Cleveland. Have we figured that out? On I mean, so, so, I mean, you got a 14-year-old sometimes that is as big as, as, as a grown man, right? I'm playing against kids who maybe not be as physically advanced as, as some kids. So we don't want to discourage anybody from playing, right? I was always a heavier kid growing up. I'm Sam, you were, you were a bigger kid too. So, you know, have we figured that out? At least I think you were. Yeah, I was. Yeah. Have we figured that out? Uh, Mr. Chairman, <laughs> sit, please please my seat. Well, I remember that conversation right. we had about 10 years ago, yeah. right? Uh, since Jason's taken over as director, there's no weight limits. Okay. So every kid in the city of Cleveland, if he fits the age, he can play football. Okay. All right. Very good, I, I, and I appreciate that. Um, again, if we could help you out in any way, shape, or form, just reach out, let us know. And uh, I'm confident that the council president will also look into everything he can do to, to make sure this is successful. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much. Uh, Councilman Anthony Harrison. You know, hard to believe I had those concerns too growing up, you know. <laughs> uh, but, no. but nonetheless, uh, just Council President mentioned one thing to the chair, to the team. Not all muni teams are a part of the Cleveland Muni League. There are some that operate on their own. Do the chair, is that correct? Uh, chair of the council, uh, I heard you mention the Lake Erie Sharks earlier. Um, yeah. That was a program that was formerly part of muni football. Uh, they operate independently out of another league. Uh, so they're not part of muni football, but they do practice on city property. Gotcha. And through the chair to the commissioner, do we interact with that other league at all? Uh, to the chair, to the uh, councilman, no, we do not. However, we do issue the permits out of recreation. Okay. All right, so we issue the permits through the chair. Uh, what I would say that, in addition to Council Belenzik mentioning uh, with the Cleveland Muni League and making sure folks kind of clean up and take care of what, they, what they're uh, practicing and playing, but that the, the recreation department also make the same uh, requirement for those who we give permits to who are not a part of the Cleveland Community League as well. That is Parking cool. on, the, on the grass, you know, creating their own situations at some of these parks, I think needs to be addressed as well. I, and I'm not singling out any one particular team, but we, I'm, I'm sure we all have teams in our neighborhoods that are not part of Cleveland Community League, which is a little bit more, you know, intimate and regulated. Uh, but the teams that are not part of the Cleveland Community League that we just issue general park permits to, uh, that we kind of keep a, a real close eye and we engage them a little bit, little bit uh, more to ensure that they are following park rules, mm -hmm. that they are adhering to uh, whatever stipulation that the permit says that they are required. Absolutely. Thank you. To that, to that point, though, what the uh, Councilman Palencia stated earlier, we issue the permits, but if we find that those teams are not following procedures, we will pull those permits. Okay. Yeah, we will pull them. And, and, let me, and again, we don't want to, you know, push anybody out. Mm -hmm. We, we want to be able to, to work with some of these teams, you know, to, hey, the do's and don'ts, how to respect where you're playing, how to, you know, keep the community on your side and, and wanting to uh, work with you. And you may get some who want to work with some of these teams at an even greater level uh, that they currently do uh, now. And, and, and as in the closing, Mr. Chair, to the team, I agree. The, the level at which, you know, our hometown team is, is providing support is, 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 uh, is, you know, is ridiculous. And that, you know, I support my colleagues' uh, mission in, in trying to work with them to increase the dollar amount. I would venture to say if, they, if this has been a dollar amount for 20 years, it didn't start with the Haslam's. You know, or, or the quarantine owners. This started before they got here, and it probably just a simple thing. I'll, I'll say, I'll go out on a limb and say, you know, they just continue what was already on the books and, and moved on. You yeah. know, and, and give them a fair shot to be able to um, to be able to uh, right size their commitment uh, to this uh, ever so important uh, Cleveland Muni uh, football league. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much, hey, you know, Chair, uh, Mr. Dunn. Hey, I well, um, just want to follow up on, with, uh, on that with the, um, with the programs park, practicing at the park that's not part of Muni football. Mm -hmm. So, Chair of Council, 
Um, years ago, under the previous administration, uh, it was said that these teams that's not playing in Muni football would still be vetted through Muni football. You know, just because we go through it, we have, we have a process of, of vetting our teams, okay. uh, background checking our coaches, uh, so we know exactly who's out there on the field. Um, from what I see, you know, the, yes, the city does issue permits, you know, for these programs to participate that's not part of Muni, but do they really know who's out there with the kids? You know, they're not background checking. So that's something that we could do, you know, if we still had an opportunity to vet these teams. And like you said, not taking the opportunity away from anyone, right. just knowing who's out there working with the kids. And, you know, we could get that message across as far as keeping the fields clean, no parking on the grass, you know, just that extra layer of protection for council. And, and, and Mr. Chair, uh, to Mr. Dunn, I, I really appreciate that. That would be something I'm sure all the members would would, uh, would would support. I can't speak for all members, but you know that's something that, if it's working now with the teams that are part of the league, then it should work with the teams who are not. And so I'm looking at the commissioner. You know, hopefully we can, uh, and our assistant director who's here, you know, find a way to begin that. You know, because that probably would help some of the situations that many of us experience at Trumba Park where they practice, or at uh, Dugan Park, or other parks across the city. And I only use those two parks because I know those two parks. They're in both my ward and Council Polinsic's ward on the northeast side. So, you know, I hope that you know the, the, the department would will work with the Cleveland Muni League to uh, to really implement that and enforce that. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Uh, seeing no other questions, ordinance number 407-2023 stands approved. All thank right. you, guys, and look forward to uh, seeing you at the field this year. All right. And that's how everybody can help them, be there to support them babies by going to that field because uh, it's really um, a good experience watching them play. Thank you. All right, uh, before I go back to our Fidelity Hotel piece, because I do see the director here, can we get Mimi Court up? Because I want to make sure we handle our guests first, and then we'll follow up on the economic development uh, piece of legislation. So this is ordinance number 429-2023 by Council Member Griffin, by departmental request, an emergency ordinance authorizing the Director of Finance on behalf of the Cleveland Municipal Court to enter into one or more contracts with court community service for professional services necessary to press to place criminal defendants in community service and for placement in the Cleveland Work Crew Program, both as referred by the court for the Cleveland Municipal Court, each for a period of one year with a two with two one-year options to renew, exercisable by the Director of Finance. Uh, director, or, um, who's going to present? Mr. Uh, Russell? Uh, yes, Chair. Um, Chair, to the council members, uh, I'm Russell Brown. I'm the administrator for the Cleveland Municipal Court. Um, we are here today um, to seek two contracts on behalf of the court and the city in terms of um, our defendants being able to um, do court community service uh, with uh, you know, court community service, uh, Paul Cloder. We are seeking, again, a contract to allow uh, probationers who are um, suited for work in the community to be able to work off some of their fines and fees. And uh, then secondarily, there's a second contract with uh, the uh, crew, um, the, um, the uh, Cleveland crew, we have a contract with them to also work on behalf of seniors in the community, on behalf of nonprofits and other projects that the city needs to have work done. Okay. Uh, and obviously I'm with uh, the court's finance director, Ms. Michelle Kenny, and uh, Obviously, the phenomenal Mr. Paul Cloder, Executive Director of uh, Court Community Service. Absolutely. Um, Mr. Cloder, did you want to add anything, or Ms. Kinney? Um, first, first of all, I, I, um, I just want to thank the support of the council. Um, I was going to start off by saying that we've been here for 38 years, but after hearing that the previous organization's been here for 104, that kind of makes my statement seem a little less impactful. <laughs> um, but um, I do, I do want to say that even though we've been here d doing this for the court and for the city for 38 years, every time I come here, I always pretend it's our first year 
Um, I feel as though we have to prove ourselves every year. I don't take the support for I don't take the support for granted, and we are out there um, working within the city of Cleveland uh, to provide an alternative for folks that that the court feels is is fair, and also has a positive benefit both for the part both for the defendant and also for the community itself. Um, so I just wanted to thank all the support we get from the council and from the courts. All right. Um, Ms. Kenny, do you want to add anything? Um, just to let you all know, this was part of the approved budget that was already approved um, as of April 1st. So this was one of our contracts that was included in the budget that the council did approve. Awesome. So this is a $369,000 uh, allocation is that for three over a period of three years? No, annually. That's annually? for one year. One contract is for two seventy, and the second contract for the Cleveland Court crew is for ninety nine thousand six hundred. Okay, so those two together is what it comes up to. Correct. Okay, and each year, so this is a period of one year, beginning in January twenty twenty three, and it is. One year, one, uh, two one year options. So each year you guys will be coming back in front of us for these? Or how does that operate? Uh, generally, the, if there's an agreement between the two to uh, continue the relationship on its own. Yeah, the law So you won't have will. to be here in for legislation for that. Correct. Okay, and the reason I'm asking is because pretty much I think Mr. Clover does a great job. To be honest with you, this is probably the best investment the city is doing. Um, just the fact of when you reach out to them and they're able to clean up. Um, and I love the idea of having sometimes people that often mess it up to clean it up. Right. Um, to actually give them the responsibility to do that. So I think this is one of the better programs. I really would love to see it highlighted more. Because uh, to be honest with you, it's probably one of the saving graces in Cleveland. Had it not been for court community services, uh, we'll probably have even more litter and more debris scattered around of our community. So I want to commend Mr. Cloder and everyone, and I'm pretty sure you're about to hear a parade of those kind of tears <laughs> from everybody else, okay? Um, but I do want to make sure that um, I always start off with uh, my uh, leadership team first, and then I'll go to all of the other uh, different folks. So I have McCormick, did you, uh, yeah. McCormick, Santana, and then I have Bishop Polisic. And I'm sorry, here I had Hairston Bishop Polensic. Okay, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I appreciate uh, Mr. Cloder's humility of coming and saying that every year he has to ask for the support again. But I would argue, Mr. Chairman, that he earns that support throughout the year with the work that he does. So, yes. um, but I do appreciate those comments. Um, I appreciate the municipal court here today as well, um, continuing the vote of confidence in this program. Mr. Chair, um, you said it perfectly. Um, this is a great way for folks who, um, you know, need to give back to a community that they may have um, done negative things to in a way that, you know, avoids heavy court costs or incarceration or things like that where they don't need to be in jail. Um, but a sense of giving back to the community um, in, in which they are in front of your judges in the first place for, right? So I, I really appreciate that. Um, Mr. Cloder uh, is a rock star. Um, he is one of those people that, um, you know, uh, in 100 years when he goes home to the Lord, he's going to know that he put everything out on the field. I mean, he's just one of those people who is such a hard worker, is so dedicated, is, it's unbelievable. I mean, every time my office reaches out, no matter what the answer is, we get a specific answer, the work happens, and we get a report out of what happened. Um, and so I just, again, we could sit here all day and, and, and rain praise on you, Mr. Cloder, but I just really wanted to say that, um, you know, we appreciate your work and your team's work, but our communities do. Our residents that we're sent here to represent do. Um, I think you are a model of what we need to continue to do when it comes to criminal justice reform, when it comes to community engagement, when it comes to um, partnerships with government and other folks. So again, um, I'll just echo the council president. I think this is a model program. Um, thank you, um, Mr. Cloder, for all the good work that you do and for your engagement with my office. 
Um, and again, I want to look at the folks, our leadership from Muni Court, and once again, thank you for your vote of confidence in this program. It makes a big, tangible difference in our neighborhoods. Our, our residents see it, they feel it, they appreciate this program. Um, and again, I am a yes vote on this, if you can't tell, but I, again, I just really wanted to thank you, Mr. Cloder and, and Muni Court, um, just for that ongoing. And again, Mr. President, I'll leave it with saying, he proves himself um, throughout the year. So yes, you come here for these renewals, but you do, you get a vote from me because of the work you do throughout the year, not by coming to the table today and asking for it. So um, again, just wanted to share my gratitude, Mr. President. Thank you so much. I have Harrison, I'm gonna start, I have Santana, Harrison, uh, Bishop Polensi. Thank you, Council President, and I echo uh, leadership's remarks. I think uh, Mr. Clore, um has been amazing. I actually met you when I was first elected yes, I and learned about the program, um, but it's been some time. So just um, mm -hmm. for educational purposes, I'm curious to know how many people are in your department through the chair? Um, we, have a, we have a fairly small staff. We have um, a total staff of 19, and of that we have nine full-time people and nine part-time people. Um, within the office, there's myself, the executive director, the assistant director. We have two full-time placement persons, and we have two full-time clerical folks, and the rest are crew supervisors. Uh, and then in addition, we're blessed with uh, 15 retired professionals that also volunteer that help us with the different client placements. Got it. Um, and through the chair to Mr. Cloder, I know that there was some time maybe during the pandemic, because um, I have a green space worker at our CDC that actually partners with um, your department. I'm curious to know how have those numbers been impacted? I mean, now things are kind of getting back to normal. But things I'm are, to know how, oh, sorry. Yeah. And again, through the chair to the councilwoman, things are improving. Uh, Obviously, during 2020 and 21, numbers were down because the courts were affected by the same set of restrictions, but we are seeing a continual increase in referrals, like, and, uh, we, we, and we expect that to continue. And through the chair, what's the work schedule of the crew? Um, crews are, uh, crews are, are available for folks to work seven days a week. So we have weekdays and weekends available for people. So if they're employed, it can be scheduled around that. Um, I should also note that as, as well as supervised crews, we have agreements with about 175 nonprofit agencies mm. where folks can also be assigned to perform their community mm. service. Um, and uh, so we have a lot of placement opportunities, not just supervised work crews. Got it. Okay. That's good to know. I didn't know that. And through the chair, I have tons of cleanup in my neighborhood. And I'm curious to know, what is the process for that? Like, if I want a crew to come and help some event that I put together, is that something that other council colleagues do, or is that uh, with the program? Through the chair to the to councilman, yes. Um, it's as simple as calling me. Um, it, it's, um, we... Um, we get requests from a number of council representatives as well as nonprofit organizations, and we do our very best to try to schedule those according to when the different projects are. Um, it, uh, and those, again, those crews are scheduled through our office, and we try to make sure we fit them in according to project dates, and uh, they are available to clean up on public and nonprofit properties. Got it, perfect. I will definitely reach out. And just my story early on, I actually had someone that was caught doing illegal dumping in our area, mm -hmm. and so he had to clean up the neighborhood for about two months. So I hope that the judge is actually still doing that and keeping um, you know, these offenders here in, in the neighborhood. So I just want to thank you, thank you, Municipal Court, and I definitely support this program. Thank and if you. I can respond to the council, someone through the chair, I think that is the ultimate justice. Um, I would encourage judges to listen to what you said because um, the amount of improvement and the amount of restitution back to the community through doing community service in some targeted way versus the cost of jail and the uh, societal impact of jail, um, I think provides some opportunities. Thank you. 
All right. I have uh, Councilman Bishop. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I just want to pile on the uh, the accolades for Mr. Paul and. You know, uh, you know, when I first uh, started on council, I thought Paul worked for solely me, but I, now he, I realize he works for everybody, but I mean, he was giving us such great service. Uh, but I just want to say, iterate what uh, Councilman McCormick said and, and what you said, Mr. President, about his service to our community. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Councilman Harrison and then Palencia. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. You know, sorry, Paul, I couldn't be the Grand Marshal for the parade, <laughs> as, uh, as, as Councilman McCormick uh, indicated. But no, um, you know, I call him St. Paul, you know, because he, 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 uh, he, he comes through, you know, he's always on time, but it's when, we, when any of us need his help. Uh, but he also has a number two in the office. Her name is Lynn. It, it, the one-two punch is what I call them. You know, Paul and Lynn taking care of business uh, each and every day, including their supervisors in the office, Mike Harris, Escalante, and all the other people mm -hmm. who our neighborhoods have gotten a chance to uh, interact with. You know, so we just thank you. War 10 thanks you for your, for your commitment, um, you know, to helping our communities. Because like I talk about CCLRC, you know, I talk about CCS the same way, all the Cs. <laughs> You know, they do great work and so do you all. And I just couldn't imagine what our neighborhoods would be like if we did not have the two organizations, and particularly who we're here today about, your organization helping us to, uh, to keep our city clean in addition to what the work that our, our uh, city crews are able to uh, provide. Uh, to us, so just thank you for your you and Lynn's uh, continued efforts and your supervisors who you all interact with in our neighborhood, um, including the nonprofits that you work with in our community as well. You know, mm -hmm. got I get a chance to uh, visit these nonprofits, and some of your folks are there uh, doing community service, from cleaning up gardens to do, planting flowers and beds to mopping the floors at senior food programs, and I mean, there's a lot that goes on. So uh, we thank you. I will say that to the committee, there was a conversation that started uh, during the last administration, and, and we need to pick that up with this administration regarding parking tickets, you know, and whether folks who have parking tickets can uh, access, you know, core community service hours. You know, they get, at, they get clients who ask about parking tickets, you know, who can help lift uh, these blocks on license and other things. So that's the conversation I know our finance director is here and that we would like to have with uh, the, uh, the commissioner, uh, Johnson, our finance director, and others in the court who's involved to figure out a way to make that happen because I think that would be a, a, a really uh, a burden lifted for so many people who, in fact, have those situations where they cannot drive, so they try to drive because they block on their license and they get, they get pulled over and they go to court and then it becomes a cycle, right? And so, so many things that we can, uh, we can do and help people uh, by partnering with core community service at an either greater level. So, uh, you know, we'll be bringing that conversation forward again pretty soon. Thank you. If I may comment through the chair. Um, um, I, wanted to, I just want to reiterate um, the number of requests that we have in our office from clients asking for exactly what you're saying uh, just really continues weekly almost. Um, folks end up in our office because of the good judges of the court, but unfortunately the, the judges don't have jurisdiction over civil fees. And a lot of our folks are in the same you know, position where not where they're facing fines and fees, and this is an option, but they're facing maybe a, maybe a couple garbage fees or uh, blocks on their license. So I think there would be a lot of interest within folks to have an option like that. And I also have to say, this is not about me. Um, I have probably the best staff that you could possibly ask for, and uh, I'm sure you all know that the person at the top is only good at all the people that are on the staff. That's right. So um, I would feel like I would be really amiss if I didn't mention the great staff that we do have. Thank you. All right. All right. Thanks, Councilman Harrison. Councilman Palencia. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm wrapped with batter here to my colleagues and to the <coughs> administration that is here. And I want to always thank Michelle Kenny for being here, a wonderful resident of Ward 8. Um, it, but to, to Paul, again, I want to echo the comments of my colleagues around the table. We appreciate everything you do. 
my only question is, I guess it's follow-up on my colleague, Councilman Harrison. Um, do you see the problem getting worse or better in the city with the amount of litter and dumping, especially legal dumping? To the councilman, through the chair, um, I sometimes comment that the, the best thing that we could do is put ourselves out of business. Um, unfortunately, I, I, don't, I don't see that happening. Um, I think my very unofficial, non-researched observation is having been doing this for 38 years, I think there's areas of the city that are vastly improved, and I think there's unfortunately some other areas of the city that are either haven't changed or, or might in some ways be targeted more. Okay. Um, so I think there's plenty of work to be done, and I think it has to be kind of a multi-prong approach, if you will, um, between programs such as ours through, and through some of the great work that the community development organizations are doing, and also, if it's ever possible, possibly to look at the enforcement end of it. Okay. Do you believe the budget amount that, it, that is being allocated here is sufficient? Uh, in terms of our budget, yes. Okay, okay. Um, my, op my own observation is that the dumping problem and the illegal dumping problem, um, which I, is the same, is getting far worse, especially with tires. Mm -hmm. And I I'm looking at right now the ordinances pertaining to tires. Um, and wh when you see the amount of tires that are being distributed throughout our city, they're not coming from Mr. and Mrs. Jones changing a tire on their car. They're coming from somewhere. And I've got this new phenomena where you'll go down the street and they'll deposit three and four tires in front of every tree lawn in the middle of the night. Just, you know they're coming off of a truck because they couldn't put that amount of tires in a car. Right. So they're coming from somewhere, I'm, I'm assuming they're coming from tire dealers in the city are people who are selling tires, both new and used tires in the city. And I think we collectively, um, we have got to look at enforcing the penalties, uh, the code provisions as it pertains to people who sell and distribute tires in the city, and I'm looking at that now. Um, but at the end of the day, I mean, it's just amazing. It seems like every meeting, I was just at the East 140th Street meeting last week, same thing about the illegal dumping in the neighborhood off of 140th Street, south of uh, Lakeshore Boulevard and mm -hmm. north of St. Clair. Um, so at the end of the day, we got a, we got a problem and that we've got to increase the penalties in their surveillance. And I was under the impression that the city, Mr. Chairman Monopoly Collins, was going to put out more of these quote unquote mobile cameras that they tell us that they have, yet I don't, I don't, I don't know where they're going and I don't even know how many we have. Um, but I think we're going to have to take a look at that whole process as well. We've got to catch these people and we've got to prosecute them to the fullest extent under the law. There, and there's no excuse for what we're seeing in some of our neighborhoods. Absolutely outrageous, the amount of illegal dumping. So again, I'll leave it at that point. I just want to again thank you um, for what you're doing and um, the courts for assisting as well in this yeoman's task of keeping our streets and our neighborhoods clean. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much. Seeing no other questions, ordinance number 429-23. Is that it? Yep. 429-2023 stands approved. Keep up the great work, Mr. Cloder. Appreciate you. Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right, uh, let's bring back up um, the uh, Fidelity Hotel uh, ordinance number 188-2023. I believe that the economic development director as well as uh, the chief have reconvened and have an answer for us regarding the question that Councilman Casey presented. Um, so let's just jump right back into Councilman Casey's line of questioning. Councilman Casey, do you want to reiterate your question? Make sure that we get the right answer. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, to the uh, director or our CFO, just clarification on um, the second bullet point where it indicates that uh, the district would have otherwise received but if the TIF by the county for district payments. Um, 
through the chair to the councilman. I guess um, let me back up and explain kind of the way the cash flows work on these TIFs. So I hope that will answer everyone's questions. So as you know, when you do these, it, it, um, enter in these, into these TIFs agreements in year zero, there's a baseline of, of tax value, and that's how much property taxes we collect. Those taxes, those tax, that amount will always be treated the way it's supposed to be treated. It comes in, it goes to various authorities, metro parks, schools, anyone else who has a millage with, um, with the county and the city. So what we're dealing with is the flow of the increment, which is the increased value as we've developed, redeveloped this property. So we've got two, two flows, initial um, property sponsor owner pays property taxes to the county. That baseline tax amount goes, is flows back out to all the entities the way it would normally flow out. Flow out. It's the increment that's the difference. So that incremental increase flows two directions. The schools get what they would normally get. That's when we say this is a non-school tip. It does not affect the school. So let's say it's 60%. They get their 60% of that amount. That 40% goes back to the city, but not to the general fund. It goes to the Department of Finance that in turn transfers it to economic development. We in turn send it out <laughs> to the escrow trustees based on our escrow agreements. They, in turn, flow that money back out based on their escrow agreements, TIF, the TIF escrow agreements, to whatever entities they have. Now, I did a quick graphic if you guys want to see it. I didn't get a chance to do a slide. I'll do a slide and send it out to you. But I think that's the question you had, trying to understand where the money flows. If you could just hand me that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's not. It's not a complicated process. Here so, you go. <laughs> well, part of it, can we can okay, you explain the ahead. reason, just as clarification, the reason why that is in place is because the county fiscal officer handles property yes. taxes. All property so taxes. So the reason the that that step is in there with the property tax is because the county is the arbiter or the person that intakes all tax receipts Correct. from the city. Through the chair, yes, that is correct. I mean, city the, those property taxes. Yeah. Um, municipalities, cities do not collect property taxes. The counties collect the property taxes. So, Ms. Uh, Beasley, do you so, want to point? Clarify for the councilman. In what you read earlier, the district is referring to this um, school district, not a TIF district created okay. by the county. All right. So, Mr. Chairman, to director, when it says in here in quotes district payments. Those, that's the money that's going to the school system. School 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 school. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'm sure it's all cleared up and everybody's even more confused about it. Now. Actually, I'm glad you asked that question. It helps It helps us better as we look at these tips. I think that's a good point. Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Uh, Councilman, uh, I got Councilman Palencia. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Council. Thank you, Mr. President, and to my own colleagues, and to Mr. Jackson, for the better explanation. I just want to make sure, because we raised this where you weren't here, that from now on, as we get the summaries, I want to make sure that the dollar amount uh, that we're actually the TIF, the dollar amount over the whatever amount. This one is 4.4 over 30 years. I want to make sure that's in the summary. Uh, for future TIFs, so we can really see what the actual cost is of that. So I would hope that that would be a standard process and procedure as we go forward. And um, I, again, I appreciate um, this the project I support. I think it's important. Thank you very much. Through the chair to the councilman, to be clear, when we say the dollar amount, we are talking about what we anticipate financing with a TIF agreement, yep. not what we anticipate the total increment will be. So if, if we have a project that is coming to us for gap financing and that has agreements, in that case, we're saying this is what we anticipate paying out. There are actually some TIFs where all the proceeds just flow back to the project sponsor for them to use. Well, in this case, so, it was 4.4 over the 30 so, years. Yeah, so that's what we're anticipating. Okay, the so as long as project. that's in each in a, in a future summaries we get, it's going to help us better understand the process. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Councilman Harris didn't have that point. Did well, she, she just said exactly what I was going yeah. to say. There, there, you have, there's uh, differentiate between two. There's different ways how it goes. 
uh, full flow of tax and then the other so as, as a director mentioned so I was going to mention that point but some of the summaries we get have that dollar amount and some don't I don't yeah. know is that just an internal office function through, maybe through the chair to the councilman I will say that some of the summaries that you've gotten are TIF agreements that we entered into before I came to the department um, I am trying to in my Emmy is part of my commitment to actually underwriting these tips and understanding mm -hmm. what our commitments are. I'm actually trying to attach the dollar amounts to it in terms of what we're going to be paying for, what we anticipate the debt service that's going to be attached to these tips. Okay, so that explains why some some summers we received in the past had a dollar amount and some didn't have a dollar amount. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councilman uh, Conwell. Let me get to this point first to KZ expert. I understand it. I had, a, had this in principal practice in real estate and real estate finance for an elective. Just because you didn't have it, I had it there. No, man. but you, you asked the question, man. You were being sarcastic with this because you didn't no, know let's it. Go ahead, go ahead with the Because uh, you question. didn't know it, you think somebody else. Go ahead, Councilman. Here's the thing. That's you. The county, can they streamline this? Because when you go through there, you're spending so much dollars in, um, in labor process. dollars. Can you, the question is going through here. I'm just asking you a question. You think they could stream, streamline it? Because they're going through so much, through so many steps to, uh, to get it down here to the, uh, to the agreement. You got it going through all these steps here, not you, but the county. <laughs> the Director? Through, through the chair to the county. I'm asking, I'm it's, just asking it, a question. To be honest with you, what do I you mean, think? my department flows this money out with um, the Department of Finance. It flows through the city really quickly. Once through the city we, quickly? What? Something goes through the city quickly? I never yeah. said anything go through the let's, city quickly. If we could, let's, let's make sure we... <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> through, through the chair to the councilman, we just got... We get payments twice a year. Right. And literally, when they hit yeah. finance, they they're, the they're, they're put into the appropriate funds, and we I mean, disperse them. I just literally dispersed all the payments that are supposed to go out to the escrow trustees today, and those mm -hmm. checks will be issued and sent out quickly. in the next couple, in quickly. probably this week. All right. Okay. I'm just asking. All right. Because I just know the nature. <laughs> Director, I think it would be great if we did see that chart. I think that would be helpful to everybody. And then also, if I'm hearing a resounding request from all of the council members is if that number can always be in legislation. I think you do it anyway, um, but it'd be great for that number to be in there so we actually know that hard number uh, that we're actually saving for these. So that'd be great, okay? Through all the right. chair to the councilman. Thank I mean, you through so the chair. much. Thank you so we'll much. Do. Seeing no other questions, ordinance number 188-2023 stands approved and look forward to it. I would like um, at some point in time, and this is a question that I ask the economic development director quite often, but um, how many hotel beds do we need? And is somebody ever going to get to us where we start to kind of establish what is the need? And, um, and, and, and you know, because I don't want to start having a whole bunch of empty hotels and then somebody's coming to us and saying we want another TIF. So at some point in time, we need to understand what we have in capacity and what is the goal that we're trying to get to. That's a very good point. Through the chair, I mean, well, to the chair. Um, we actually, um, DCA actually just did a hotel study and um, I'm also collecting some more hotel research so we can better understand that. And not our, the hotel city received was focused really on downtown, and we'd like to understand what the whole city needs because yeah. we've got different types of hotel needs based on the type of tourism. Uh, when you look at why people come to the city and what they use, I mean, what they stay in hotels for, I mean, you have, you know, your business um, tourism, people who come for business, people who come for health care, and medical tourism is a huge... Um, sector for us in terms of hotel opportunities. So we need to know what that looks like and people who come here for um, recreation, sporting events. So, Thank you. And that, um, I appreciate you saying that because being a person that has the Uptown District and the University Circle District, I'm just as interested in how many hotels we need in that footprint as well uh, because we know that that generates about 25% of Cleveland's economy. So I want to make sure that we understand that as well. And um, I just want to say this for the record, Chief Abu Nama or anybody else, I know that a lot of people make a lot of um, assumptions, but um, you guys got a heck of a economic development director. She's one of the people who oh, I would you. say have really 
taking the time to really try to help us understand these processes and procedures. And I'd be remiss if I didn't take the time saying that as far as council goes, she's been going above and beyond trying to make sure she helps us understand uh, the impact of these economic development deals. So I wanted to say that publicly, okay? Thank you. Thank you. All right, anything else for Director Jackson? Looking forward to uh, seeing your boutique hotel. And of course, you got one of the best attorneys in yes. town. So <laughs> yes, we do. appreciate it. Looking thank forward you. to working with you guys. Appreciate okay? it. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right. Okay, uh, that's going to be heard. 188 2023 will be heard for full consideration tonight. As you all remember, we have held this for the last two or three weeks, uh, so this has been vetted. I did feel comfortable walking it on today because it has been through the vetting process several times. So we're here tonight uh, for consideration. Thank you so much. All right, uh, we're going to bring up uh, what number you got? 480? 2023. Who is that with? Uh, hold on, let's do this. Let's do Chiefs real quick. One more with the Chief. This is just a quick one with Chief. Chief, just as one quick one with you is 464 um, 2023. This is the Strategic Priority Fund. Um, I do have a recommended a, um, amendment. And this is uh, in 464-2023, an emergency ordinance to amend section two of ordinance number 1294-2022, passed December 5, 2022, relating to establishing the strategic priority subfund. Ordinance number 464 by Council Member Griffin, uh, by departmental request. And the one amendment that I am requesting, Chief, tell me, um, and I would have to need an amendment from one of the members at the table, is that um, in section two, it has civic participation. And we believe that since we did not move that forward, and this is the sub fund that we're having, the strategic priority sub fund, uh, that we strike civic participation as one of the amendments. And uh, other than that, I don't have any, but do we have a um, motion to strike civic participation in section two of ordinance number 464-2023? Do I have an amendment? Councilman Casey has put a motion. Councilman Casey? Sure. Um, Mr. Chairman, in section two, line four, if we could just, um, strike civic participation. All right, uh, do we have a second? Second. second. All right, second is Councilman uh, um, Hairston. Uh, all in favor say, or is there any discussion? Seeing no discussion, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so uh, Attorney Roberts, if you could make that adjustment, appreciate it. All right, Director, please proceed and tell us what, what we have with this fund, sub fund. Thank you, Council President. So uh, what we are proposing in this amendment is to add three new authorized purposes of expenditures in the sub fund, uh, one being public and capital improvements, two, uh, public health, and three, enhancing the effectiveness and accessibility of government services. Uh, we, we, if you recall, Council uh, created these, this sub fund in December of last year. Uh, to as the place where the revenue recovery funds went after we went through that process with our ARPA cash. Uh, and given the, the nature of some of the proposed uh, projects that have been discussed over the last several months, uh, it was clear that, that we needed to increase the authorized purposes of this sub fund so that we could, we could pay for um, certain, you know, really any of the projects that could come up through the council process out of this sub fund if we have the funds there for it. Okay, and that is, if I'm correct, SF 400 or 10, 10, 10 SF 400, 10 SF 400, 10 SF 400. So this is the line item that we created. Um, Chief, I'm going to ask you this question because I just want to be over cautious. Um, who's going to be on the hook if we move all this money to the general fund? And the feds come back and say, that's nice that you did that, but you still needed to abide by 2024 expenditure, I mean, allocations and 2026 expenditures. Is that Bricker and Eckler, or is somebody going to be guarantee us that we won't 
see this next council because that'll be in the next council term that we won't saddle them with the um, unfathomable task of trying to return money because this money was put into a sub fund. Yeah. Uh, so to the council president and the rest of council, uh, a, a couple answers there. The final rules that have been put out by the Department of Treasury make clear that uh, when you run ARPA proceeds through the revenue recovery process that they are spent for purposes of the rules. Uh, we've confirmed that interpretation both with Bricker and Eckler and uh, through last year's audit uh, conducted by the Auditor of State. Um, and as a practical matter, when you we have to do quarterly reporting to the Department of Treasury as to how we're expending those funds. Uh, for any project that we're spending on, say, um, Canopy, for example, uh, we have to provide uh, regular reporting on the progress of that project. Um, that said, anything we run through revenue recovery, that's it. We just tell the Department of Treasury we put X dollars through revenue recovery, and then that's it. We don't have to do any reporting. So as a, as a practical matter, that's uh, another way in which the, the final rules and Treasury have kind of made clear that that is the expenditure. There's nothing left to do there. So just out of curiosity, this fund could last until 2030 or 2040, and nobody can come back and say, you didn't spend this money the right way. Uh, to the council president, the U.S. Department of Treasury would not be able to say that. I think, uh, you know, given that our, our hope, I think a shared hope is to get these funds out into the community as soon as we possibly can. I think we might have other people uh, asking us questions, but the, the federal government in terms of fulfilling our regulatory obligations wouldn't have anything to say about that. Believe me, if I could write the ARPA check and get all those funds out the door today, yes. so that would be one less thing that I had to deal with, it would be great. <laughs> but I just also want to make sure that we're following any cautionary tales because I do have council members that have asked several times, like, make sure we are not on the hook. So I want to make sure that we ask that question. Okay. Um, I um, do have a couple of other questions, but I'm going to defer to a couple of my colleagues, I think Casey has a question, and then Councilman Harrison has um, another question as well. Thank Councilman you, Casey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, to the to the CFO, just for clarifications, we're just adding this language, correct? We're adding public and capital improvement, public health, yada yada yada. Right? That's all we're doing through the chair. That's correct. Because there's no executive summary for this, so there's no dollar amount in this piece of legislation. Through the chair, that's correct. And then, Mr. Chairman, to the, to the CFO, how much is in that? Well, we, through the chair, we appropriated last year $215 million uh, to that sub-fund uh, that went through revenue recovery. Uh, in the ordinances that have been adopted, um, you know, it, because oftentimes it's hard for us to know until we actually get into the contract negotiation after the ordinance is passed, uh, whether the project will itself be eligible under technical ARPA or if we'll need to use the, the sub fund. And so the ordinances have been written to give the flexibility that if we can use the sub fund, that's what we're going to use because that uh, doesn't come with any ongoing compliance obligations with the federal government. Uh, I don't know that we've actually dispersed any cash out of the sub fund, but I do believe uh, from the round of ordinances that were introduced in January, a few of which that have pa uh, that, that passed and we've begun the contracting process, uh, there has been some funds that have been encumbered uh, in that sub-fund, but I, I don't know that number off the top of my head. All right, and that was my next question, how much of this has been allocated or, or encumbered? So if we could get that information, we'd appreciate it. Thank yep. you, Mr. Chairman. So that's a broader question, and Joe, and I know that uh, Mr. Titran has reached out to you. Um, Chief, in order to make sure that we have a full accounting, if we could have a full breakdown on what's in each account, what's been out there. I know that we have a tracker that we kind of think is very cool and can help us make sure everything, but you're the finance director. We want to make sure that we get uh, verify and cross check and make sure that we understand what's um, out there and what's available. Yes. Okay. Councilman Anthony Harrison. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Casey asked one of my questions, how much is actually in this fund? And from January's, uh, I won't use tranche, G January's uh, uh, list of uh, proposals and now the, the April list of proposals, what in between from, from January and April proposals have come out of this sub fund? And, you know, that's important that we know that. 
because there is no clause in here that requires uh, you to come back here to get approval if it's over fifty thousand dollars, and you know, if you all are just making a decision, well, we'll just take it out of this fund because it's less headache in order to track or to make you know we just want to support a particular project and be done with it. You know, council needs to know that, and, and I'm and I'm thinking, Mr. Chair, is that this is necessary for us to add the clause in here, uh, the fifty thousand dollar clause for if there's projects above that that the administration think is better funded out of this fund needs to come back to council for approval. Through, through the chair, if, if I may, in mm -hmm. each, so let's say uh, for the uh, Birthing Beautiful ordinance, that, that ordinance will provide the spend authority for that project. And uh, I, I could say, for example, that one will not come out of this sub fund because of the the particulars of that project is gonna come out of the grant fund, mm -hmm. the 15, it's a fund 15. Um, but there is no spend authority connected to this ordinance. The spend authority comes with each project's particular ordinance. Uh, and our default is to spend out of the, the sub fund uh, because of the, the lack of any ongoing compliance obligation. So it, it reduces burden on the city going forward and it reduces risk that uh, Treasury could come back at some point in the future and say, uh, you misspent the grant proceeds on a project that wasn't eligible when instead we can just use money that went through revenue recovery and is, the, and is thereafter free of the federal restrictions. So our default is to use this sub fund because of the, the, uh, the way it mitigates risk for the city. Sure. Uh, and, and the compliance burden going forward. Absolutely, and that's my point. You know, because this is the default, you know, council needs to be aware if you all are deciding to fund things out of this uh, this sub fund versus going using the grant yeah, actual and, grant dollars themselves, and what mechanism is there besides is asking you can you provide us a list? Should we add in here, Mr. Chair, you know, a provision that requires any um, uh, reason the administration believe this fund should be used as a default to provide council uh, notice that this they intend for this project to come out of uh, this fund? It, you know, not not you know looking at the $50,000 clause, but at least something that there, that you all shall provide us a notice that you intend to use as, this fund as the default to uh, support a particular project. Yeah, and, and through the chair uh, on that point, each, I believe, each of the ordinances that was introduced, that is being introduced in this next wave of, of recommendations, uh, if we believe it will be paid for out of this sub fund, it's identifying the, the funding source in the ordinance itself, the 10 SF 400. Thank you. Well, Mr. Chair, I don't think we should wait until we actually get a piece as introduced. I think council should be aware of that uh, ahead of time and not wait till you get a piece that says it just come out of that sub fund. I think it would be helpful to us to know that, you know, to anticipate that a piece is, is being funded out of the sub fund and not just waiting to get that information once it, we receive it uh, at the re first reading of a, uh, an ordinance. Councilman Harrison, Councilman uh, McCormick has a point. Mm -hmm. Would you allow him that point? Sure. All right, Councilman McCormick. Thank you, Mr. President. And on the Councilman's line of questioning, I just want to point a clarification, either from the Chief or Mr. Roberts. It, uh, this, any expenditure over 50000 would still require legislation out of this fund. Is that correct? I'm just trying to get clarity on this. Through, through the Chair, yes. So, so this legislation does not provide the administration expend authority? It, it does not. OK. All right, um, and, 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 and thank, uh, absolutely. Thank you, Councilman. And absolutely, I understand that fully. You know, uh, we're on the same page. My thing is just knowing before we get uh, the the best tool that we have to know where something is being funded is to have that fifty thousand dollars, right? But if that's not necessary and as I need in this case, the second best is if there if we require a notification to this body that they anticipate funding something out of this uh, sub fund and not just rely on the piece once it's introduced for the first time at council. And they were looking, okay, where, what fund is this coming from? Is it coming out of this fund? But having some pre-knowledge of, of where this fund, the money is coming from, you know, particularly this fund, because it was clear when we set this fund up that we council wanted to make sure that we were on top of, we were keeping an eye on what was being spent out of this uh, particular sub fund that was being created. Or maybe I was wrong. Maybe that wasn't a concern. No, no, that's, I mean, that's always been a concern. Yeah. How would you word it, Councilman, and what would you Well, I don't know. I, I, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm 
Chief, how can we talking it through. word that? Because, and I want to say this just for full disclosure to everyone, you know, by us being the council and, um, you know, that's really serious about our oversight process. We want to be flexible to help make sure that we don't Absolutely. put anyone in a straitjacket, but we also want to be clear and concise in how things are coming in. Chief, what yeah. would you recommend that we can use as language to make sure that we get that notification? Because I do agree part of what I spend an enormous amount of time doing is helping people understand where money exactly. is coming from ARPA and the original rules based on what we did with lead safe broadband, food bank, and some of those other ones prior to the final rules, and then what money's coming out of this SF fund. And that is becoming a regular question, so how can we actually get notification, and what should we put in there to be, make sure we do that? Yeah, so through the it's chair to the council. Uh, I'd be happy to sit down and talk about how we can make that happen. I think in, in many cases, the inter the sending the legislation up to council for introduction is really the point at which we know what the funding source is going to be and we know what the program is that we're asking council to approve. Uh, and so maybe it's more of a, a, a regular re reporting on the sort of the, the life cycle of the cash that's in this fund. Is it free balance? Is it encumbered? Is it, has it been spent? And just providing that accounting on, you know, a monthly basis, a biweekly basis, whatever works for, for council. Because um, I'm, I'm struggling sort of procedurally to identify a way that we could give council an indication of the funding source before we finalize the, the draft ordinance that we want to send to council for consideration. Because it, they're, they're kind of one in the same. Well, Mr. Chair, I, I, through the chair, you know where, when, you, when you're drafting an ordinance, and you're putting the numbers in and where this money's coming from, you know where the money's coming from. Right. You got a 99% a, a chance, or an under 90% chance, but 99% understanding of, of how and where you want to fund this project from, right? All I'm saying is not just relying on a draft that comes to us, because you can put together a draft, and once it flows through the internal process on the administration side, it may be a month or two before it even is, is sent over and introduced, right? There could be a gap. But if we, if we have an understanding, uh, or even weeks beforehand, of, of at least for, and for our tracking purposes, right? And so not just waiting to is introduced on a Monday night, you know, would be helpful with some sort of notification that you intend to uh, fund something out of this sub fund and, and it not be a surprise to us, oh, they're taking it out of this sub fund, right? Because we get so many of those, let's say in one night, and we get, we get a lot of these, okay. we get five or six ARPA pieces uh, in one night. And, you know, unbeknownst to us, all five or six are coming out of this sub fund. Well, wait a minute, right? You know, what discussion... Was there any discussion to figure out whether it needed to come out of the grant or whether the council was better, um, um, you know, able to support it coming out of the, the, the grant dollars or whether we, 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 wanted, we, don't want to, we don't really support it coming out of this fund, we support it coming out of another fund? You know, can I have that upfront information so that way if those things need to be, to be flushed out, then they can be flushed out ahead of time and not being flushed out once you have already drafted a piece and introduced it? Through, through the chair of the councilman, I'm happy to work with you on what that could look like. Yeah. Here's something that I could think through in this initial phases, and I think Councilman Harrison brings up a good point of making sure we understand that. But in the legislative summaries, um, where you have the, like Fidelity Hotel is a good one, where they had the project address, developer, but that still won't get to your point because it still doesn't notify you. It's the, after the fact. After you, the fact. Know, you know what I mean? Let's 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 talk through that because I mean I don't I don't want to I think we can work something through that if you guys can have that conversation I don't I don't think we should I think we should get notification but I also don't want to hold up everything just for one thing I, I think we could work out a process to make sure that we get notified and I'm thinking if it's a way to do it through the executive summary or some way to the councilman's point I'm just trying to brainstorm on where and how that can look but Councilman Harrison you had a point and then Councilman Polinsic had a point of uh, clarification but go ahead just a really quick and I don't know if this would satisfy the conversation but so chairing transportation uh, poor control emails me 
the legislature that's going to be introduced in advance, just kind of like, hey, are there any issues do you see with these pieces? 99.9% .9 of the time, myself, Councilman Slife, review them and say good to go. Um, so I don't know if that would be for each chair. We, we set that expectation with port control where they email me in advance of intro, hey, these are coming your way. I, I'm just, I don't know if that's a potential, but it works well for us. Yeah. And we just tell port control, yep, good to go. All right, point of information from Councilman Polinsic, and then I'm going to give Councilman Harrison a wrap-up on yeah, this. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, it's, it's, it's a point of information and then an alert. Uh, at last week, because uh, just to dovetail what you said, at last week at the Safety Committee, it was brought to our attention that one of the members of the Citizens Police Commission, New yeah. Citizens Police, <laughs> had recommended, publicly had commented, to be under they, 50, they, they need to figure out how to circumnavigate city council. Yeah. yeah. And I, I was just appalled when I it heard that. Internally too. That they should come in with four, uh, legislation for $49,500 yeah. So to escape council oversight. I, I could not even believe I was here. But they were actually reading his quotes at the table. Reading his quotes at the table. So I, I want to alert my, all my colleagues, and above you, to the finance director, that, let me tell you, th there will be pain at the pump yeah. if, that, if, 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 that, if there's an effort to... to Yep. perpetrate that upon the taxpayers of the city of Cleveland and this council. Right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and I'm glad you said that because it's not just about council, it's also about the role of transparency. Yeah. And a lot of people don't realize that the reason this is in place is not just to stroke councilmatic egos, but also to deal with transparency, That's exactly. which the public demands. So just keep that in mind as we had a conversation. Councilman Harrison, final closeout, how do you recommend? Final closeout, I would say, Mr. Chair, maybe we, we uh, are we able to amend after finance or no? After amend. finance, we, we can only amend. This is the last chance to okay. amend. I was going to just recommend that, you know, council shall receive prior notice of introduction um, uh, of any items that are intended to be funded out of the sub fund. And where would we put that um, as, as make a short? I don't know. Where you, where Mr. Roberts, can we, I, I think if it's just something just to say, to, to codify or just something, Comments. if we just put, if I'm looking at this, um, just, even if you just had a small section for it to just say it just council will receive notification and that notification you could say via chair via council as a whole etc but um how would you word that councilman harrison and where would we slip that in at if that was the case through the, through the chair if i if i may sure, offer uh, typically in the codified ordinances if we're providing notice to council it runs through the clerk uh, and so just for ease of uh, communication, central point of communication, I would suggest that. Yeah, I don't think it needs to go to each individual. That's chair. fine. So can we do I, that? We add it to be, the clerk shall be notified um, of which fund that this we come from and put it in, in that legislation. So can we read, read that amendment as you would like it posed so that we can have it accurately stated if we could? That council will receive notification of what fund these allocations will come from via clerk or how would that say? I think we, 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 and Kevin can clean up the language. <laughs> I see his, uh, the air in his chest going up and down. Um, that council receives prior notice before introduction of any uh, ordinance um, that the administration intends to fund out of the sub fund, what is the sub fund number? SF 10, 10 SF 400. 10 SF 400. 10 SF 400. 10 SF 400. Uh, to the clerk of uh, council. Okay. Is that you? Is that you have that uh, council uh, attorney? I don't have um, council president. The underlying ordinance, twelve ninety four dash twenty twenty two. You know, we're only amending section two of that. This this ordinance here is only amending section two. It's adding that that phrase where we're public and capital improvements, et cetera. Are we, is Councilman Harrison's motion, is it to add to section two? I mean, I want to know where it goes. I don't, it's not having, not having the other ordinance here. I don't know what it looks like. All right, so Councilman Casey had a good suggestion. Do we think we just need to pass our standalone legislation that can be applied to all these pieces or what do we need to do? We can come back and visit that. If, if there's just, 
there seems to be a, not a way to. I mean, I think I, I'm the, fine if we just added it to the language on this. But, I mean, Casey brought up a good point. I just want to make sure that we. Because this is an amendment to the previous ordinance. Uh, Attorney Roberts, that is not is it not good enough just to have it in this piece? Yep. Through, oh, no, uh, through the through the chair, yes. I just pulled up the the ordinance, the original ordinance, and I think we could add an additional amendment to section two, uh, noting that um, any any proposed expenditure consistent with this section would be the the there would be notice given to the council clerk so well, something like this that. this would do just purpose of uh making sure we don't rush this um councilman casey's point was a good one we'll we'll let it go for now and then if it's something we think we want to make sure we get if we need to just come back and we'll do we, that i'm okay. happy to do that yeah. all right we could always so make it later so we don't tie it up today. that's right all right all right okay all right so that being said, seeing no other questions, ordinance number 464-2023 stands approved. Please sign on. Thank you so much. And Chief, you have two more pieces, I believe. Yes, sir. Uh, 465. Uh, 460, ordinance 465-2023 by Councilmember Griffin. By departmental request, an emergency ordinance to authorize the Director of Finance to enter into an amendment to contract number PS 2018-165 with ACL services for audit management software as a service or audit management software and other services for the Department of Finance to extend the term of a contract for a period of one year with two one-year options to renew exercisable by the Director of Finance. Director and Mrs. Britt. Thank you. Through the Chair of the Council, I've got uh, Natasha Brandt, uh, who runs our internal audit division, uh, to discuss the ordinance. Good afternoon. Um, ACL we use for audit management software. That is used to house our audit work papers. It also is a good structure for um, setting up our audit plan our, for, for any particular audit. It um, sets up testing results. It sets up planning files. It sets up a process for review, you know, for the in initial auditor to put their work papers in there to then have a detailed review and a general review. So uh, this particular software is proprietary for this um, particular company, just like for, um, I think there's Teammate, there's uh, Magellan, there's plenty of other uh, software that does similar processes, but we've implemented this since 2018. Um, we're happy with the product, and um, the total spend on this for a three-year period is about 74000 It's under the 50000 threshold on a year-by-year -year basis, but um, because we plan to renew this um, going forward, that we're uh, trying to simplify the process for at least the next three years. Okay. All right. Anything, any uh, questions for Ms. Brandt or Chief of Finance? Seeing none, uh, ordinance number 465-2023 stands approved. Thank you so much. Keep up the good job, Ms. Brandt. All right, next up is ordinance number 480-2023 by Council Member Griffin by departmental request and emergency ordinance authorizing the Director of Finance to employ one or more consultants, computer software developers, or vendors, or one or more firms of consultants, computer software developers, or vendors necessary to implement various technology projects, services, and upgrades to the existing systems under 2023 ITS Capital Project Plan other related professional services to implement the plan and to enter into various contracts to implement this ordinance. Chief, and I know who you have with us, but can you please re-announce who you have with through, us? Through the chair of the council, uh, I have uh, joining me uh, Chief of IT, Roy Fernando, and Commissioner of ITS, uh, Kim Roy Wilson. And I'll leave it to them to discuss the ordinance. Sure. To the chair and council, the, um, the capital request that we have for 2023 is fundamentally to upgrade and replace existing equipment right now we have with the infrastructure. Network switches that are over 10 years old that um, um, 
have a difficulty being upgraded. We need to uh, bring them up to current speed. Um, within our conference room, there are Cisco devices for our collaboration teams that also needs replacing. And this also includes um, our Microsoft licenses and professional services that we need to essentially implement um, all of the infrastructure, all of the security capabilities that we have for the administration. No, no, thank you, Chief. Chair. All right, uh, Councilman McCormick has a question. Thank you, Mr. President, and please forgive me if this isn't directly tied to this legislation, but what is the timeline on the new website for the city through the chair? Uh, the chair and council members, the new website is projected to be live June 14th, to oh, my knowledge. Praise uh, the Lord. Is that June 14th? June 14th. Is that real? Is what we are tracking to at this time. Wow. So, okay. I mean, we are coming straight out of 1995 with that website, so I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited to, 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 to thank you, Mr. President. Yeah, we said they use the old Mac system, old Macintosh system. All right, Casey, did you have a, a question, Councilman Casey? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I was just wondering. I know that the administration presented um, to municipal properties and services last week on the capital projects, but that. There seemed to be some more information that was needed. Was this in the presentation from the administration? No. This is this is because this is capital project dollars too. So yeah, through the through the chair, this was not part of the presentation that uh, Chief T. Win and um, folks from MoCap and Public Works gave. Okay. Um, that project that that presentation was really focused on our physical infrastructure uh, and on projects that are. Uh, more than more likely than not to be funded with the proceeds of future bond sales. These projects are, you know, IT focused and uh, generally funded out of the restricted income tax because they're not really eligible for um, for bond sales because of the useful life. And Mr. Chairman of the CFO, that was my next question. This is a seven million dollar ask, right? So those are going to come out of restricted income tax. Yeah, Th through the chair. That's that's correct. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. Do we have any other questions? Seeing no other questions, ordinance number 480-2023 stands approved. Will be heard by the full council this evening. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next ordinance is ordinance number 330-2023 uh, by council members Bishop and Griffin by departmental request. An emergency ordinance determining the method of making the public improvement of replacing the salt dome at the Glenville Streets facility, including but not limited to demolishing the existing salt dome site pre preparation and installing a new pre-engineered salt dome, authorizing the director of capital projects to enter into one or more contracts for the making of the improvement. Mr. Edmonds and also uh, Mrs. Uh, Chambers. Yes. Oh, to the chair, to the committee, this is, as you read, the authorization to use design build project delivery method for the replacement of existing salt domes located at the Glenville Streets facility. I will let um, Carter Evans finish the summary. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair and uh, members, uh, these uh, I have three very similar pieces of legislation before you today. Uh, in all of these cases, these are existing capital projects that are funded. Um, the legislation that we're looking at today is only for the selection of what form of contract we use to execute these projects. So this is to authorize the use of a uh, design build contract for these. Um, all three of these have been reviewed and approved by the Design Build Committee. Um, and I'd like to talk a little bit about the projects and what the reasons we feel uh, that uh, Design Build is the most advantageous procurement method for the city for these projects. Um, the first one um, is the Glenville Salt Dome. Um, we have uh, been working with uh, streets on uh, the salt domes that uh, we know are in various uh, states of disrepair. This is the most urgent uh, one that they need replaced. Um, we've been uh, talking with them on different options of how to do that, what it should be like, what, how big it needs to be, and so forth. Um, doing this as a design build uh, project uh, allows a couple of things. First of all, salt domes are typically pre-engineered building systems uh, that 
are designed off-site and um, assembled on-site. Uh, so the bulk, and that's the bulk of the, the work is, is the salt dome itself. Uh, so that already is essentially like a design build project. It's, um, they're pre-engineered building systems. There's a handful of typical typologies uh, that are used. Uh, also, the um, single source of responsibility between having the design, the site work, the preparation, uh, all of that under one uh, contract gives us a, a, a sole source of responsibility for the entire project. One of the key issues here also is um, procurement lead time. Uh, items such as uh, you know, uh, pre-engineered building systems, salt domes, are going to have a long lead time in procurement. If we were to follow the more traditional design bid build process, we would have to put out an RFP, hire an architecture engineering firm, put that out to bid, get under contract with a contractor, and only at that point could they begin really starting a construction schedule and start to procure some of these long lead items. Um, in this case, we'll be able to put out the criteria documents, get the whole design build team on board together, start procuring that, and that way it'll uh, shorten the overall critical path. Um, those are the primary reasons we feel that that's the, uh, the best approach for this project. Um, and as I said, it, it is funded, and uh, we're ready to move forward with it. All right. Uh, you want to add anything, Ms. Johnson? No, nothing to add. You did a great job. All right. Councilman Polinsic. Thank well, you. Before I go to okay. Councilman Polinsic, Councilman Bishop, this was heard in, uh, in uh, Municipal Services. Do you have any questions? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. We uh, vetted this and uh, we support it. All right. Councilman Polinsic. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Honorable colleagues to the administration. Um, is, so this, the legislation is to replace the existing dome entirely with a, with a new dome or a new concept? Uh, through the chair to the council member, this would replace the dome. Uh, we uh, did a site assessment together with streets. Uh, we believe some of the domes are repairable. Uh, this one is beyond that point. Um, so we, we did do an assessment of it. It will be replaced uh, with a dome of a similar size, but a bit of a different configuration. Okay. I noticed that some suburbs, Mr. Chairman, go with Quonset type structures. But again, Mr. Chairman, to the administration, here's a classic case once again. We build them and we don't maintain them. I've gone past that thing I don't know how many times and I watched the, the shingles off of it. I looked at, saw the holes in the roof. Same with on the one down here by the Joseph L. Stamps facility. I mean, someone is gonna have to tell me from the administration at some point, what are we gonna do to maintain this stuff after we put it up? To me, I, I just shake my head. All you had to do is hire a roofer to get over there and fix the holes in the roof. But we let this stuff go to the point it's no longer fixable, and then we've got to replace it. So, Mr. Chairman, I think that's going to be the big challenge of this council as we go forward. Because we've been talking about it more and more internally, West Side Market, et cetera. Where's the, where's the game plan to fix this stuff? It would have been, you do a, you do a, a contract, get a roofer in there, fix the holes. Fix the holes. But it just sits there and sits there and rots. And now we got to replace the whole damn thing. I don't make, doesn't make no sense to me. It really doesn't. Uh, through the chair to the member, I, I, I can't speak for property maintenance, but I can tell you going forward uh, for capital projects for the salt domes, we uh, have added a program. Uh, like we have a lot of ongoing programs for like, uh, your rec center roofs, yeah. public safety roofs, those kind of things. We've added a program uh, specifically for salt dome uh, rehabilitation replacement over 2024. I believe it's through 2026. Um, so we can repair the ones that need to be repaired and replace the ones that need to be replaced. Well, okay, uh, I think, Mr. Chairman, all of us are, uh, all of us around the table, we're going to have to just, every time we see something that's deficient, we're going to have to put it in writing. We're going to have to drill down on it because we're just wasting taxpayers' money. We know how important salt dorms are. You've got to keep the salt free uh, from moisture uh, if we're going to abate the ice um, and snow on our streets. But th to have these sit there and become just an embarrassment to, to the motorists going past it, not counting the employees, um, speaks for itself. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. Thank you. Uh, don't see any more questions. So. Seeing no other questions, ordinance number 330, 
2023 stands approved. Please sign on. Thank you so much. Uh, next ordinance is ordinance number 331-2023 by council members Bishop and Griffin by departmental request, an emergency ordinance determining the method of making the public improvement of replacing the boiler at the second district police station, integrating the heating systems and adding controls, authorizing the director of capital projects to enter into one or more contracts for the making of the improvement. Um, Assistant Director or Mr. Edmondson. Mm -hmm. This is also a design bill request as previously mentioned. Um, this project will also include demolition of existing boiler and certain components of the heating distribution system, installation of a new boiler, conversion from steam to hydronic heating, combination of what is currently two unconnected heating systems into one system and new controls. All right, uh, Mr. Edmonds. Thank you, Mr. Here. Chair. Uh, again, this is a funded existing capital project, and we're just looking at the uh, delivery method or, or form of contract today. Um, the current heating system at uh, the second police district is two independent boiler systems that are unconnected and, and not controlled together. They're all, it's all sort of manually controlled. Uh, one of those two um, has deteriorated uh, significantly um, and needs to be replaced. And in doing so, what we intend to do is provide one comprehensive heating system that has integrated digital controls and convert from an outdated steam-based system to um, a, a much more robust um, stated you know, current current best practice uh, hydronic system. Um, one of the main reasons for this uh, to be a design build project is, again, it's the sole source of responsibility. But we find in a lot of these um, MEP projects where we're going in, sort of dissecting the building, we really need to do that investigation beforehand. And the only way to do that is to have those MEP contractors, plumbers on board who can actually take the things apart, get into the walls, uh, and determine the final exact scope of what needs to be done. So having the single team of the engineers and the contractors working hand in hand will assure us that we get the right scope. Um, lead time is also a significant issue with uh, uh, major mechanical systems too. So being able to procure that earlier would help with the overall project lead time. Okay, thank you. Councilman Bishop, this was heard in... Uh Municipal Services. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, we've heard this. Uh, we fully support it. All right, thank you. Seeing no, oh, Councilman, uh, Councilman uh, McCormick. Thank you, Mr. President. I mean, I, I support this. However, it's a million-dollar contract. Are we looking at these districts? I mean, the second district is awful. So we're going to spend a million dollars into it. Are we looking holistically at the districts and the capital plan for these buildings? Because obviously putting a million dollars into a building without a comprehensive understanding of what is the lifespan of the building, what is the city's goal for the building, what's its existing lifespan, have we looked at that? To either uh, through through the chair to the to the council member, uh, we have we have done uh, overall condition assessment of uh, public safety facilities, including the police districts. We have not established a full capital plan for the police districts yet, but we are working with public safety on developing that, as well as the um, fire station modernization plan, which you may so be specific aware of. to this ordinance, then, Mr. Chairman. Um, have you? I mean, was there a conversation about whether you? You invest a million dollars in a brand new system with bells and whistles versus a shorter term fix with the understanding that maybe down the road, you know, how do you make that decision about putting a Cadillac in when you might be tearing down the garage down the road? Mm -hmm. Through the chair to the council member, uh, we did have that conversation with public safety. We feel this is the correct approach. Um, if the um, you know, we don't know if the what the remaining lifespan of that building is. Obviously, we need to you know figure that out in a uh, in a comprehensive capital plan. Um, but this is the system that the facility needs, um, and it will be for whatever that lifespan is. It'll be reliable and energy efficient, which it's not now. But chair to the um, commissioner, I mean, isn't that understanding the age of that facility? Shouldn't that be a critical component of authorizing a million dollars in expenditure? So th just uh, through the chair to the council member, uh, just as a clarification, this is not authorizing that. This is a, an existing capital project that was part of, I believe it was last year's capital plan. Um, but it's the, um, 
we, we feel after our discussions with property maintenance and public safety that the, the right thing to do for this facility is to have a system that will support that facility for as long as we need it to. Okay, and I, my apologies. I'm reading here a million dollars authorizing the director of mayor's office of capital projects to solicit proposals to enter into contracts for design build at a million. Am I reading that wrong? Uh, through the chair of the council, that's correct. So it's authorizing a million dollars for design and build. The the million dollars is already authorized uh, from previous bond money. This is just to do a design build contract as opposed to a design bid build contract. So there was a million dollars previously authorized for the boiler system at the second district. It's authorized under. Um, we, I mentioned uh, like ongoing programs like the public safety roofs. This is under the public safety MEP. Okay, but this million dollar expenditure has not been authorized. The general fund for capital for public safety has been. The this this project will be under the I believe it's the it's either the 2021 or 2022 uh, public facilities legislation that authorized that money to be spent for public facility okay, public okay. safety MEP projects. So the, the general fund has been authorized, not the million dollars is what I'm saying. Right, look, and again, I'm not, I'm not against investing in the heating system when they need it, but I'm just wondering if we're really thinking through a million dollars is a lot of money, and if we come back in two years and say X, you know, X districts have a five-year lifespan left, uh, I'm making that up, right? I have no idea. But the point is, is that I think it's important that we understand these things before we sink tons of money into them. But that's I don't so have the answer today. Just well, wanted to bring that point up through, through the council, through the chair to the council member. It's a, it's a good point, it, it, and, and I'm not trying to, to minimize it. But um, to give a little context of some of the experience we've had in the past, um, we did starting in 2014 with casino bonds. We we did a lot of band-aid projects, uh, particularly at rec centers partial roof replacements, partial, uh, you know, like replacing one boiler of three or four, that kind of thing. Um, and we found that we were very soon coming back with expanded scopes. So we would, we'd say, okay, this boiler's bad, um, you will replace it. And then the next year, property maintenance is getting complaints about pipe leaks that were just outside that scope. So. We're, we're very averse to kind of partial measures, particularly when it comes to systems like this, um, because we're, we don't want I to be coming back that. next and year just, with the other boiler. We're almost hitting five, so I'll just, uh, um, to our safety chair, I would, just, I would like for us to follow Mr. Chairman up on that, the, specifically in the districts. Obviously, third was recently rebuilt, but the other districts that are older. Um, we'll just hit having an update on where we are with those facility plans. Thank you. Absolutely. If we could. All right. For thank sure. you. Um, seeing no other questions, ordinance number 331-2023 stands approved. Please sign on. Great, great line of questioning, uh, Councilman. Great points. Uh, ordinance number 427-2023 by Council Members Kelly, Spencer, House, Bishop, and Griffin by departmental request. An emergency ordinance determining the method of making the public improvement of constructing mechanical, electrical, and engineering plumbing, electrical, I mean, mechanical, electrical, and plumbing improvements at Cudell Recreation Center, Thurgood Marshall Recreation Center, and Camp Forbes, and authorizing the Director of Capital Projects to enter into one or more contracts for the improvement. Assistant Director mm -hmm. and Mr. Edmonds. Yep, Chair to the committee, this is just like the previous two. This is to use the request to use design, build, project delivery method to complete these improvements at Cudell. Thurgood Marshall and Camp Forbes. Um, the scope has been determined in collaboration with property maintenance, similar to the previous ones, and will continue to be reviewed with the selected design build team. And this is for the main, to replace main air handling unit with a dedicated outdoor air system um, with distributed variable refrigerant flow for temperature control and integrated digital control systems. And at Camp Forbes, this will replace the air handling unit for the administration building. So this is to use design, build, project delivery method to complete this work. Okay. And to uh, thank you. Um, Mr. Chair and members, uh, so this is 
a continuation of another one of those ongoing uh, streams of capital improvements that we do, that this one specifically the rec center MEP. So we've had several of these projects uh, going along over the last uh, four or five years or so. This uh, $2 million is actually the combination of two years worth of, of that funding so that we could um, do this project. Um, and uh, this, the, uh, this is done by assessment uh, and in collaboration with uh, both property maintenance and feedback we get from REC about their facilities. Uh, so these are the next REC centers in line for that improvement. Um, and there's a, it's, it's really, I won't rehash some of the same reasons, but really we've found the, um, often we do a design, we engineer it, we go out to bid, we get under, under construction, and we uncover a lot of unforeseen conditions once the contractors actually get in there and start taking it apart. So this will allow the engineering and construction team to work together to um, really do the, do the thorough investigation and make sure we have a, a really solid scope of work. Um, lead times also apply to this as well, again, with major mechanical systems. Uh, I do want to clarify that when we say mechanical, electrical, and plumbing systems, the electrical and plumbing components of this are really those portions that support the air handling units and the uh, MEP systems. So it's, it's really a, an HVAC, it's a big scale HVAC project with some supporting engineering. Okay. All right. Uh, this is heard in DPS. Councilman Bishop. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we heard this in uh, MSP this morning, and uh, we fully support. All right. Thank you. Uh, seeing no other questions, ordinance number 427-2023 stands approved. Please sign on. All right. Next up is ordinance number 466-2023. Uh, by council members, thank you, thank by you. council member House, an emergency ordinance uh, to supplement the codified ordinances of Cleveland, Ohio, 1976 by amending section 162 as amended by ordinance number 373-2022 passed June 6, 2022 and enacting new section 173.18 relating to compensation for the commission on black women and girls. Uh, this is in essence, we passed an ordinance to support black women and girls, uh, but the next step, what they would like to do is to um, allow for these positions that you see in this legislation, uh, which is hereby created the Commission on Black Women and Girls, consisting of the mayor or his or her designee, one member of council appointed by council, one city employee from any office or department appointed by the mayor, and 12 persons who shall include the following, a representative from the faith community, representative from business, representative from preschool, primary or second school, representative from college, representative of grassroots organization, representative who is a member of a union, representative from a local hospital or doctor of medicine, or a representative from a social service agency who is employed social worker. Uh, so this actually lays out the terms. This gives the structural uh, parts of the term, and it does give a uh, breakout of the actual per annum per annum salary of 89.63 per annum that uh, the members of this board will receive uh, for serving on this. Once again, this is something that council has already supported and the reason that we supported it is because of all of the metrics surrounding uh, black women and girls in the city of Cleveland and we wanted to have a special focus or initiative on them. This is now putting the structural side together and the uh, compensation side. Does anybody have any questions regarding 466-2023? Mr. Chair. Councilman Bishop and Councilman uh, Harrison. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, is there, is there, is, will there be 11 members? Is that what I'm saying? How uh, many members will it be? Yes. Or eight. 11, right? because if you count those three in the upper, in the, uh, in A, plus the other ones that they have. Okay, and then Mr. Chairman, the terms of these uh, appointments, are they, uh, how many, how many, it's four year terms? 
Uh, the terms are in section B and it said an appointing authority for those described in the division above shall be as follow. The mayor shall appoint those described in subdivisions one through four. The council shall da, 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 da. Uh, three, three oh, years. here it is, three, three years. years. Yeah. Okay. So it's uh, five members shall serve three years, five members shall serve two, two, uh, two uh, serve two years, and then four members shall serve one. So it'll be staggered terms. And um, one, one other question, Mr. Chairman. We'll, we have to fund this, um, we have to fund this thing annually. Do we know the annual ask of this commission? Uh, I believe that they, I believe that the next step that they are trying to put together is the actual compensation and structure, and then they will be presenting us with a full, um, a full proposal of what else they would need in the following year's budget, but not this year's budget. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. Any other questions? Councilman Harrison. Thank you. Um, just, so you said two members from the mayor appointed? Yes. One from council and eight from the folks, the community list that you just mentioned. Is it, uh, what's that, let me see, one member of council appointed by council, one city employee from any office appointed by the mayor, and 12 persons who shall include the following. So that's more than 11. It's way more than 11. No, that's. It's 12. 13, 14. Well, that gets 13. 13. And I know that Councilwoman House is the key person who put this one together. Oh. Um, I tell you what we can do if we have other questions because this is actually a council piece. Um, we can get it out of finance, but then what we could do is make sure that Councilman, Councilwoman House can clarify no, the other structure. No, that's fine. I was just wondering. So, so we got 11 on that, you said 12 on that list below? Or 11 it looks on that 13, list below? looks like 13. 13 total? Yeah. And how many, the council gets one, and the mayor's office, get, they pick how many? <clears throat> That's 14. And who 11. chooses all the rest of that yeah. list you just named? When, no, we, mayor no. puts one four, and we appoint five to eight. Five to eight. Yeah, so right there in, the st in uh, Section 9, or I apologize, the appointing authority in Section B, okay? It has Section B, the appointing authority for those described in Division A above shall be as follows. The mayor shall appoint those described in subdivisions 1 through 4. So the mayor determines or he um, appoints through a representative of faith community, business community, preschool, and college. Then council... Okay, um, according to this, council shall appoint those described through subdivisions five through eight. So council will appoint the grassroots organization, the union member, the local hospital representative, and the social service agency. And that's how many? So that's a total. What's he talking about? Yep. So if you look at the explanation, it gives a breakdown under 162.01, all of the composition and the terms and who appoints them. So it looks like it's pretty much an even split with the mayor and council determining who will um, serve as the three major positions. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's fine. I, I was just looking at this. I see one, the mayor himself. Uh, or his designee, so that's one, and then he appoints one person from the administration. Uh, so that's two people from the administration, and there's only one council employee, council person on this body. Uh, I personally think that it needs to be two and two, uh, coming two from administration, two from council, and then we split the appointments as uh, noted in the uh, body. But this isn't my piece, I'm just, I'm just providing my two cents, so. I, one of the you know. things that I've been very cautious about is that many of the women members of the <laughs> body have wanted to design and take the lead on this. That's why I just and I've I been stopped. very cautious. Don't look at me, man. Don't look at me. To to uh, you know to they let them over. sign this up. The, the last thing I need is that us men went and told them how to run their committee. So. 
I just listen, want, and, yeah, and, 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 and got some president. They beat me up. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I had to pull him up off a of conference. Mr. So. Chair, that's why I, 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 I hear you. I, I feel you. back. I just asked. You, I know we have two <laughs> black point. women uh, on uh, council. We have Councilwoman House and Councilwoman Gray. Yeah. We have one member on here. But hey, I'm going to respect I, the council I, ladies' I, wishes. If we need to make an amendment at a later date, I think we can. Okay. But All right. right now, I'm going to respect the council ladies' wishes. And I'm going to respect it as well. So right. I, just, I just put my two cents and asked the question. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair. Thank you, sir. Yeah, appreciate you it. You packed that. Mm. They told All right. Me thank up, you. Man. Yeah. All right. Seeing no other questions, what number is that? Ordinance number? Uh, 466-2023 stands approved. Uh, next resolution number 477-2023 by Council Member Griffin, an emergency resolution declaring April 2023 as Child Abuse Prevention Month in Cleveland. Uh, this is once again a council resolution. Uh, basically just declaring April as uh, um, a um, <laughs> Child Abuse Prevention Month. Uh, do we have any other comments? Seeing no other comments, ordinance, I mean, resolution number 477-2023 uh, stands approved and will be heard by the full body tonight. Last but not least, uh, we have ordinance number 477, 477, Dash 2023 by Council Members Starr and Conwell, an emergency resolution opposing House Bill 12 that renames the State Department of Education to the Department of Education and Workforce and revises and transfers most of its powers and duties to the newly elected governor appointed Director of Education and Workforce. Uh, Councilman Conwell, did you want to have any remarks regarding this? Yes, I want to say this about Council Member Starr. We went down Thank state um, last, one. last week. Was it last week? Yeah, it was last week. And we um, narrated to them how this bill is not a good bill, how this bill is um, political. And we, in the bill, in this resolution also, that um, the governor already appoints eight members to the state school board. The bill also will, it's a power grab that will take um, the power from the State Board of Education and put it under the governor's office, similar to the way Ron DeSantis down in Florida, what he's doing. It would also hurt us in the long run when you see what's going on. It would, we believe that it will attack uh, critical race theory and uh, it won't let the people have a voice on um, education matters. And um, so we got down to the, we explained it to them that we opposed it, how it would hurt us and, um, in, um, in the city of Cleveland. And after um, having a, a discussion with the state representatives, they agreed with us and they tabled it. So it might come back up again, but we won on that day. I don't want to go through the whole narr how we narrated it, but um, it was a good fight, a good argument. And um, so I'm asking council to support us. Uh, this will help us again, as well as the teachers union, because we know that uh, we're going to have to revisit Columbus to continue with this fight. But we need the support of city council. We need the support of the 376,000 residents in the city of Cleveland. Um, when we go to, to fight this battle. So we need your support behind us. So that's what I'm asking you, to support um, this legislation. All right, Councilman, I only got one ask for you as you keep going down to Columbus. Don't let them recruit you and try to take you and make you down there permanently because you're spending too much time down there. So There's so many crazy <laughs> bills being pushed down there. All right. You got to fight it, man. No, but we all in, in favor of you. Like I said, just uh, remember that... Uh, we all behind you with that one, so thank you so much. Seeing no other questions, um, what number is that? Resolution number 477? What number is that, Councilman Hairston? This is 478 2023. 478 2023 stands approved. Please sign on. Uh, that concludes this uh, finance, diversity, and uh, inclusion um, meeting. Stands adjourned. Thank you. Thank you very much.